Chapter 12. The Self-Crucifixion of the Crazy Christ Quote, You can choose a ready guide in some celestial voice. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. End quote. Rush. Free will. Rule number seven. Pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. For something that is seldom billed as either philosophy or spiritualism, Jordanetics often tends to strike a highly religious note. Fans of Jordan Peterson often speak of him in awed, reverential tones, and he has observably attracted a devout following that can only be described as cult-like. Although he utilizes a wide variety of religious allusions and illustrations throughout his first six rules, it is not until the introduction of the seventh rule that he begins to openly address a religious imperative. He describes an ominous vision of flying, during which he soared over a tremendous landscape that was filled to the horizon with massive glass pyramids that were full of people trying to climb to the top of them. And above each pyramid was a Sauron-like disembodied eye that simultaneously transcended and watched over the frantic activity below in a patient, predatory manner. The occultic symbolism of Peterson's vision is not particularly difficult to recognize. This is imagery often mentioned in reference to the Osiris slash Horus slash Christ melange to which he frequently refers. The pyramids are Egyptian. The bird's eye view is an oblique reference to the all-seeing eye of Horus, usually represented by an owl with one eye. Peterson, in the vision, is transcending the world below like the illuminated elite he serves. In his vision, he is beyond heaven, beyond hell, and beyond the chaos of the world, soaring free in glorious and unfettered detachment. Carl Jung, who serves as a sort of John the Baptist to Jordan Peterson's Christ, once wondered what preceded the Osiris myth, which can be traced back about 6,000 years. But Jung, like Peterson, is convinced that the Osiris legend was the seed of what both men consider to be the Jesus myth, although Peterson always does his best to avoid being forced to directly answer the question, even when specifically pressed to do so. The sixth rule is intended to guide you as you venture out from your spotless house, ready to enter into engagement with the world without judging it. Peterson's vision provides his credentials. Like the floating eyes, he is above the fray and is therefore more than capable of guiding you through the chaotic circles of the world hell, a Virgil to your Dante, permitting you to enter the world without attempting to enslave it, and enabling you to eventually be transformed into a floating, detached eye yourself. The pursuit of meaning to which Peterson provides the map necessarily involves transition, not just from low-status lobster to the middle way, but from man to demigod. At the beginning of the chapter, Peterson identifies the transition of men from animal to human. While he admits, for once, that his account is nonsense from a scientific perspective, he deems it sufficiently correct thematically to serve as a useful analogy. In this developmental progression, men learn the art of longer time preferences through the killing of large animals that provide too much meat to be devoured immediately. From these longer time preferences, man develops the ability to distinguish between mammoth now and mammoth future, which inevitably led to the development of various concepts such as sacrifice, personal reputation, the social contract, compound interest, and the Black Shoals formula for the pricing of options and corporate liabilities. All right, I must confess that I added the last two items on the list, but I hasten to point out that they only make Peterson's anthropological invention funnier. They don't actually render it any more ridiculous than it already was. So as we so often must do with Peterson's fanciful excursions into the past in order to explain the present, we must set aside both actual history and science in an attempt to discern his actual purpose. The seventh rule, therefore, concerns the socio-spiritual course an individual is advised to take once he has found his place in the middle of the pack, ditched his former friends, and avoided the temptation of lording it over others. But the path Peterson is encouraging the reader to walk is a winding and serpentine one. Rather fittingly, 
Concerning his own habitual dishonesty and the deceptive nature of his books, Peterson makes frequent reference to snakes. The very worst of which, he tells us, is the eternal human proclivity for psychological, spiritual, personal, and internal evil. But if this excursion into metaphor is not surprising, Peterson soon reverts to his customary incoherence when he suddenly shifts his focus back to his very poor grasp of biological science and wonders if human vision was an evolutionary adaptation that resulted from the necessity of detecting snakes, then theorizes that this non-existent adaptation might explain the way in which the Virgin Mary was often depicted in medieval and Renaissance art. This stream of incoherence goes well beyond simple ignorance, as the following observations will suffice to demonstrate. First, human vision is neither stunningly acute, nor is it unique. Both birds of prey and sharks have better vision than humans, while horses and other herd animals have nearly 360-degree vision as well as better night vision. Bees see more colors, and cats require less than one-sixth the amount of light that humans do. Second, given that every year, ten times more people die from lightning strikes than from snake bites, it is less likely that human evolution has been affected by poisonous snakes in any way, shape, or form than by a single talking snake in the Garden of Eden. Despite his profession of a dedication to the Darwinian truth, Jordan Peterson clearly does not understand how the theory of evolution is supposed to work. Even if we posit an ancient population bottleneck, the number of historical snake bite deaths required to make a snake spotting mutation a reproductive advantage to Homo sapiens sapiens is several orders of magnitude higher than is conceivable to any sane biologist or statistician. Third, the fact that the Virgin Mary is keeping her infant well away from the poisonous snake has absolutely nothing to do with her keenly evolved snake-spotting vision. It is simply an artistic combination of a mother defending her child incorporating a visual reference to a well-known Bible verse. Following an equally bizarre exploration of fruit and color, Peterson declares that this dread snake, this symbol of chaos, this embodiment of evil, also gives men great mystical visions and dreams, as per the endowment of the knowledge of good and evil upon humanity in the Garden of Eden. With all the discussion of Jesus and Mary and Adam and Eve, it should be no surprise to discover that this rule concerns a decidedly religious course of inquiry. If you have followed the rules to this point, you have begun to rise through the social order. You have begun to sort out the material world along the way, and in doing so, you have risen above the underworld of the oppressed. Continuing with the Genesis theme, Peterson returns to Cain as a symbol of chaos. But incredibly, he claims that the story of Cain is an abstract precursor of Jesus Christ's sojourn in the wilderness. Here Peterson comes to what may be his ultimate statement on religion and its central importance to the seventh rule. Quote, no tree can grow to heaven adds the ever-terrifying Carl Gustav Jung, psychoanalyst extraordinaire, unless its roots reach down to hell. Such a statement should give everyone who encounters it pause. There was no possibility for movement upward in that great psychiatrist's deeply considered opinion without a corresponding move down. It is for this reason that enlightenment is so rare. End quote. Twelve Rules for Life Peterson underlines the point by utilizing this concept to explain his deep mystical understanding of Christ's desert encounter with the devil and his subsequent taking the sins of the world onto himself and accepting the responsibility of paying for them. Far from being a sinless scapegoat for mankind, Peterson's Christ is a Crowley-esque all-sinner to whom nothing human is alien and no sinful act is unknown. This idea of Young's, which Peterson finds so deeply informative with regards to the observed scarcity of enlightenment, is similar to that of the occultist's emerald tablet, upon which is inscribed, quote, As above, so below, and as below, so above, in the accomplishment of the miracle of the one thing. And just as all things have come from one, through the mediation of one, so all things follow from this one thing in the same way." End quote. 
In fact, Carl Jung himself found deep and direct inspiration from the emerald tablet, relying on his own dream interpretation of a green stone tablet that appeared to him in a series of visions. This informed his writing of the private hermetic work, Seven Sermons to the Dead. Jung's branches of heaven are as above, and the roots are so below. Alistair Crowley explained the operations of the emerald tablet in similar terms. Quote, that is to say, in order to perform his miracle, the magician must call forth his own god in the microcosm. That is united with the god of the macrocosm by its likeness to it, and the macrocosmic force then operates in the universe without, as the magician has made it operate within himself, the miracle happens. And as the macrocosm is the greater, it follows that what one does by magic is to attune oneself with the infinite. End quote. The Revival of Magic, 1917. So, Peterson's philosophy is significantly influenced by this esoteric tradition in which the cause from above is directly reflective of the effect below and vice versa. The causes from below have effects that resonate through the cosmos. Too much order leads to too much chaos. As above, so below. You've got to go through hell before you get to heaven. Of course, this philosophy can hardly be considered particularly profound, as it has been expressed many times in many ways, including the song Jet Airliner by the Steve Miller Band. The esotericism of Young and Crowley and Hubbard also influences Peterson's 12-rule path with regards to the state he describes as being. Being means that, quote, Christ is forever he who determines to take personal responsibility for the full depth of human depravity, end quote. Here, Peterson's he does not refer to the historical figure of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What Peterson is saying is that anyone who takes personal responsibility for the full depth of human depravity is a Christ. As a psychologist who has dedicated himself so profoundly to the Holocaust and to the hell of human existence, there would be little doubt that Peterson sees himself as one of these Christs, following Jung's roots into darkness even if we did not possess documentary evidence of Peterson's Messiah complex. Christ the symbol rejects the dominance hierarchy, as does Peterson the self-perceived Messiah, in order to save the world from itself. Quote, I came to believe that survival itself and more depended upon a solution to the problem of war. I had a notion that confronting what terrified me, what turned my dreams against me, could help me withstand that terrible thing. This idea, granted me by the grace of God, allowed me to believe that I could find what I most wanted, if I could tolerate the truth, if I was willing to follow wherever it led me, if I was willing to devote my life to acting upon what I had discovered, whatever that might be, without reservation, knowing somehow that once started, an aborted attempt would destroy at least my self-respect, at most, my sanity and desire to live. End quote. Maps of Meaning the architecture of belief. The letter to his father quoted in Maps of Meaning is the key to understanding absolutely everything you need to know about Jordan Peterson and his philosophy. Combined with the evidence provided by the 12 Rules for Life, the inescapable conclusion is that Jordan Peterson is a mentally ill occultist who seeks to save the world from nuclear destruction by uniting the nations of man under a single global government through a collective devotion to his esoteric religious philosophy. More than 100 years ago, Carl Jung suffered a profound and disturbing experience he called his confrontation with the unconscious. What we might describe as a midlife crisis today, given that he was approaching 40 at the time, he described himself as being menaced by a psychosis while at other times he believed himself to be caught up in the throes of schizophrenia. Like Peterson, he saw visions and heard voices. He began inducing hallucinations through drugs and meditation and recorded his experiences in illuminated script and paintings and notes in a large red leather-bound book which he called the Liber Novus, or more casually, the Red Book. He secretly added to the book for more than 16 years. Over the course of the next 80 years, it was read by fewer than two dozen people, until, about 10 years ago, the young estate 
finally permitted the publication of the book. In concert with the origins of the Red Book, Carl Jung and a few friends founded a group called the Psychological Club in 1916. It continues to this day as a gathering of leading doctors, attorneys, and scientists to study Jung's analytical psychology. It is remarkable to read a description of one of these seminars, as one could readily believe that it is Peterson, not Jung, being described in these weighty terms. Quote, An involuntary hush falls on the room, as Jung himself stands quiet and grave for a moment, looking down at his manuscript as a sailor might look at his compass, relating it to the psychological winds and waves whose impact he has felt on his passage from the door. The hush in the assembly means not only reverence, but intense expectation. What word adventure shall we have today with this creative thinker? What question, like the stroke of a bronze bell, will he leave ringing in our minds? What drastic vision of our age will he give us that will help us to lose our sense of problems, subjective and oppressive, and move into a more universal and objective realm? End quote. Elizabeth Shepley Sargent Harper's, May 1931. Like Young, Peterson portrays Christ as one of the avatars of a symbolic person, an everyman who has appeared in many concepts throughout the ages. Christ is merely one form among many. What Christ and the all-seeing eye and Marduk and the Logos all represent is the expression of being as Peterson defines it. This identification of Jesus Christ as the all-seeing eye is a particularly important one that is significant in the analysis of the later rules. Although Peterson frequently refers to the Logos, he never defines it very specifically. Young did in a 1934 interview called C.G. Young Speaks, quote, Christ the Logos, that is to say the mind, the understanding, shining into the darkness. Christ was a new truth about man. Mankind has no existence. End quote. Peterson does, however, quite literally, compare himself to Christ. Quote, Christ takes a different path. His sojourn in the desert is the dark night of the soul. It drove me into the desert, into the long night of the human soul. End quote. Peterson's Christ complex is too obvious to miss, but what might be easy to overlook is his declared confusion over his inability to comprehend the Cold War. It was during his time in the desert that he found himself walking the enlightened middle way between the USA and the Soviet Union, two great armed factions with missiles aimed at each other. It is here that we finally begin to comprehend why Peterson has filled his family home with the chaotic hell of Soviet propaganda as opposed to the ordered heaven of American propaganda. The two factions are the two halves of the Taoist duality, the twin serpents of the yin-yang. Peterson, in portraying himself as a visionary Christ figure capable of saving man from material destruction, is personally demonstrating his philosophy in action. Just as one must rise to the middle of the pack in order to escape the chaos of the bottom of the dominance hierarchy, one must rise through the ranks of hell to work one's way into heaven. The only path to true enlightenment is the one that he has found, acting wisely through inaction while making the decisive choice not to choose. Although Peterson never openly states that the resurrection of Jesus Christ never happened, or that Christianity is merely a symbolic religion rather than a true reflection of the spiritual world, he makes it clear that despite the esoteric power its symbolism represents, the Christian faith itself is baseless and its moral tradition is of little more than historic utility. He compliments the faith, but in an abstract way referring to it in the past tense, as if it has already fulfilled its ultimate purpose in laying the groundwork for the next step in religion that Jordanetics represents. Quote, This is not to say that Christianity, even its incompletely realized form, was a failure. Quite the contrary, Christianity achieved the well-nigh impossible. The Christian doctrine elevated the individual soul, placing slave and master and commoner and nobleman alike on the same metaphysical footing, rendering them equal before God and the law. End quote. Twelve Rules for Life While Christianity did help man progress further along the path of true religion, Peterson deems it to now be obsolete. 
there is a transcendental next step that awaits the spirit of man, a transcendence to a state beyond the good and evil of Christianity. If the worldview of Jordanetics is correct, man began as a mere beast at the time of his creation, worshipping the confusing forces around him, before he gradually evolved, mentally and spiritually. One of these evolutionary developments was Christianity, upon which additional advancements have been made. But as Christianity and its various fruits, including science and modern progressive morality, imposed excessive order by solving many problems that were previously unsolvable, this created a need for something more suited to address the ever-mutating chaos of being. The antidote of chaos is not order. It is the transcendent religion of the balance, a religion in which heaven cannot be gained without first experiencing in full the emptiness of the wilderness and the agonies of hell. Peterson, by his own admission, has become the Christ of this new religion because he has paid and continues to pay the price in the coin of human suffering. If you hope to follow his example and achieve similar enlightenment, you too must pay the price demanded by Rule 7. You must descend into your personal hell and suffer upon your own cross before you can be resurrected into enlightenment. The Seventh Principle of Jordanetics To Reach Heaven Above you must descend into hell below. Chapter 13 A Glib and Forked Tongue Quote, I won't denounce my previous self. End quote. Dr. Jordan Peterson Rule number eight, tell the truth, or at least, don't lie. After you descend into hell, you must learn to navigate its chaos. But while the oppressive language of order is truth, the language of chaos is the lie. Peterson openly admits his propensity to lie. He is, in fact, a deeply practiced and natural liar who admits, quote, I soon came to realize that almost everything I said was untrue, end quote. This tendency affords him the ability to navigate and express the language of hell. Since the true religion is an esoteric Jungian form of enlightenment, one of the first expressions of that practice is through one's speech. A creed is expressed, after all, using words. The eighth rule provides the newly enlightened maintainer of the balance a means of training for his speech. It also pulls the curtain back on the techniques Peterson customarily uses to communicate his teachings. It is also in this chapter that he reveals a considerable amount of useful information about his own interior world. Recall here that hell is a necessary component of Peterson's religious approach towards bringing heaven to earth. Contemplating hell fully and deeply is the only correct way to navigate the microcosm of the below, here and now, in order to achieve the infinite heaven of the cosmic above. This is why Peterson so obsessively returns to the horrors of the Holocaust and the totalitarian chaos of Stalinism. In his experience, these are the accessible expressions of hell, which provide him with the paths that will eventually lead to enlightenment. In his own convoluted way, Peterson has addressed the nature of God through his comparisons of himself with the Christ, who is the avatar of God. He has also advocated various elements of Taoism and references various aspects of Thelemism as well, but as a Gnostic, he never openly expresses a coherent religious creed. This is another indicator of his habitual disinclination to tell the truth, because creeds and doctrine are how religions articulate and define their perceptions of truth. Peterson approaches the question of what truth is from an unusual angle. Instead of defining truth as a category and revealing what he believes to be contained in it, he begins by first defining lies. Even more strangely, Peterson begins by lying about lying. He first quotes Mein Kampf in order to assert that Hitler clearly stated, you need the lie. But the portion he quotes is actually Hitler's critique of the big lie the idea that people are much more likely to fall for a ridiculous lie of colossal proportions rather than a small and plausible one. Read that last sentence again. Peterson is literally redefining the concept of criticism as advocacy. 
Hitler was a confirmed critic of this deceptive rhetorical technique, not a proponent. Hitler attributed the big lie to his enemies, capitalists and Jews, while Goebbels later declared the English utilized it. But Peterson, in his quest to identify the totalitarian mindset as something beyond ordinary evil, portrays Hitler as openly endorsing this form of shameless lying, rather than as criticizing it. This is, of course, not the first time in the book that Peterson has dared to blatantly misrepresent the words of others, but it is the first time he has done so with the words of someone whose ideas are so well known and so easily checked. Why on earth would Peterson lie about Hitler's own words and exaggerate them? Why would anyone ever feel the need to do so? Were Hitler's actual words and deeds really not evil enough in themselves? Now, if you are insufficiently familiar with Peterson's work, you might be tempted to try and defend him by arguing that because Hitler was aware of the utility of the big lie in the hands of his enemies, he eventually adopted the practice itself. But that is not a viable defense, because Peterson was quoting Mein Kampf in order to demonstrate that Hitler's objective was to create hell on earth and to generate chaos by telling big lies. This is completely untrue and is not supported in any way by the text. Furthermore, although he quotes Hitler's definition of the big lie and adopts the concept as his basis for the unique relationship between tyranny and the establishment of hell on earth, Peterson immediately proceeds to contradict the very definition he just cited. According to Hitler, the insidious big lie works on the masses because the average individual can't conceive of trying to get away with telling blatant lies. The big lie works because one bypasses the little lies to which the average individual is attuned and tells massive whoppers that are so obviously untrue that one would almost have to be a complete lunatic to tell it with a straight face. But Peterson contradicts the concept right after quoting Hitler's explanation of it. Instead, he claims that you first need to tell the little lies in order to tell the big lie. Why is this error important? Because it totally undermines the superficial level of the Eighth Rule, which states that one can transform the world simply by telling the truth, or at least not telling lies. And it should cause even the most enthusiastic Peterson fan to wonder why Peterson would so shamelessly misrepresent something so easily checked by simple recourse to Wikipedia. One might even go so far as to say that Peterson tells a big lie about the nature of the big lie. One of the more alarming aspects of Jordanetics is the innovative approach to deception it offers. Other religions make allowances for deception under certain circumstances. Both Islam and Judaism are religions that provide specific allowances for lying to outsiders in certain specific situations. When these exceptions are applied, in addition to sparing an adherent from persecution, this principle of faithful deception or lying for higher purposes has a universal strategic utility. While Nathan Hale may be revered as the American revolutionary whose famous last words at age 21 were, my only regret is that I have but one life to give for my country, he was only caught because he wasn't a very good liar. Far more adept in his spycraft was James Armistead Lafayette, a slave who was such an effective double agent that he was maintained on both the British and the American payrolls during the Revolutionary War. So, there are reasonable arguments to support ethical deception, but these arguments are always exceptions to the rules that dictate honesty. To the contrary, the twelve-rule path doesn't merely allow for lying out of necessity or under certain well-defined parameters. The Jordanetics imperative is to proactively deceive and to strive to avoid saying anything that can be readily compared to the objective truth. The point is that Peterson isn't actually telling you not to lie with this rule. In fact, he's lying about lying. If he's serving as a double agent here, he's not working for you, even though you may have paid for his book. Who then is he serving? Armistead, a slave working for the American revolutionaries, pretended to have escaped his master and fled to the British in order to ingratiate himself with them. The British paid him to spy on the Americans. 
he returned to the Americans and obtained false documents from them regarding their troop numbers and movements, which he then smuggled back to the British in order to mislead their intelligence. Peterson's confessions of his past dishonesties is meant to deceive you into believing that Peterson is now a reformed liar. He tells you the misleading truth about his past lies, implying that he is now unusually honest and upright because he struggled like Hercules against his vast inner world of lies and self-deceptions. But in his most recent book, we've seen him lie about everything from small towns and statistics to Hitler. His lies are told relentlessly, perhaps even pathologically, and yet he expects you to accept his guidance when he finally reveals his deceitful approach toward telling the truth. He claims to have cleansed his personal house of all deception and iniquity by very, very carefully choosing his words, deeply contemplating the various pros and cons of each and every measure, and painstakingly weighing the truth. But this is a false pose just as his pretense to be carefully considering every question he is asked on stage as if it was the first time he had ever encountered it, is an act. Because Peterson equates truth with survival, or rather, anything that increases one's chances of survival, truth is intrinsically subjective. And since there is no such thing as objective truth, the only thing you can do to be truthful, by which he means increase your chances of survival, is to master the art of the lie. Peterson is qualified to teach you this rule because he has, by nature and philosophy, become a spiritual master of lies. Peterson lies regularly and habitually, and here he presents a rule that does not only allow for lying under limited circumstances, but presents dishonesty as a fundamental ethic. He is not only willing to misrepresent Hitler, he is just as willing to misrepresent Jesus Christ. He writes, quote, In his human form, Christ sacrificed himself voluntarily to the truth, to the good, to God. In consequence, he died and was reborn. End quote. This is not accurate Christian theology. Jesus Christ did not sacrifice himself to the truth and the good, but to liars and deceivers, to a corrupt system of religion and careless system of government. In consequence, he died and depending upon whom you ask, either remained in the grave or rose from the dead. No one, Christian or not, claims that Jesus Christ was reborn. It is the Christian believer who must be born again, not Christ. He continues his assault on basic Christian theology with an even more blatant lie. Quote, The word that produces order from chaos sacrifices everything, even itself, to God. That single sentence, wise beyond comprehension, sums up Christianity, end quote. It is important here to note for the non-Christian reader that the first sentence in the above quote is original to Jordan Peterson. It is not to be found anywhere in the Bible or in the writings of any Christian theologian. Thus, when he describes the sentence as being wise beyond comprehension, Peterson is narcissistically praising himself and what passes for his own wisdom. That single sentence is neither wise nor accurate. Any summation of Christianity that excludes the fallen nature of man is not correct. To leave out the fall, the cross, and the resurrection is to entirely miss the point of Christianity. It is not an accident that Peterson became famous through videos and lectures rather than his writing. He is a performer. He simultaneously combines an image of personal vulnerability with a commanding stage presence. He has a melancholy charisma and generates audience sympathy through his emotions. He'll cry. He'll rant. He'll fall into sudden silences, glare balefully into the camera, or wag a finger at the audience. He'll draw upon his outdated, rustic colloquialisms, bucko, and hypnotically inspell his viewers with his disarming, soft-spoken Canadian accent. Not since Adolf Hitler has there been a more artfully practiced public speaker. It would not be at all surprising if a video archive of Peterson practicing his gestures and expressions in the mirror were discovered in the future. None of performance art comes through in his writing, nor is it capable of disguising the actual content. Twelve Rules for Life is a meandering and deceptive work, 
and maps of meaning is an incredibly tedious stream of incoherent citations. While his thoughtful posturing and folksy digressions may be engaging in public presentations, in print they serve only to infuriate the logical reader. Part of this is because Jordanetics, at its heart, is about keeping secrets. Peterson doesn't actually want most of his readers to correctly understand his psycho-religious knowledge. It's a hard-won thing, you see. It isn't for everyone. Like all secret wisdom, it is only for the elite. Most of you can't see the truth, you can't handle the truth, and you are therefore unworthy of it. Peterson's fog of meaning to which he provides the map ensures that only the most persistent individual, willing to go brave the hell of enlightenment and able to endure the underworld of suffering, pain, and chaos, can begin to master his higher truths. But by his own declaration, most of his readers are lowly denizens of hell, unable to rise out of their oppression and only useful to him in providing money, a fan base, and object lessons. Part of this is because watching an expressive, emotive actor brood about lobsters while pretending he understands science is something some people happen to find entertaining. But the thoughts of an actor, whether it is Jordan Peterson doing his deep and careful thinker routine on stage, or Bill Nye the science guy, are seldom very intelligent or interesting. One of Peterson's strengths is that he doesn't sound like an academic when he lectures. The subject matters he addresses are often shallow things, such as Disney movies, mean girls, what he eats, the suicidal behaviors of his crazy friends, and the stupid things he did when he was a child. But this anti-academic style doesn't work very well in a book filled with hundreds of citations, and the fact that so many of the citations are misleading, misinterpreted, or irrelevant renders the book even less convincing to the intelligent, well-educated reader. Twelve Rules for Life is not a subversion or a critique of academia, as some would have it. It is an esoteric religious pamphlet published in a pseudo-academic self-help wrapper. But you need not take my word for Jordan Peterson's dishonesty. He was quite willing to share his Clintonian approach to the truth in his debate with Sam Harris, a debate so disastrous that he concocted one of his most jaw-droppingly absurd lies yet in order to try and explain away what amounted to an exercise in intellectual self-humiliation. Harris, you clearly have to have a conception of facts and truth that is possible to know that exceeds what anyone currently knows and exceeds any concern about whether it is useful or compatible with your own survival even to know these truths. Peterson, well, then I would say that I don't think that facts are necessarily true. So I don't think that scientific facts, even if they are correct from within the domain that they were generated, I don't think that that necessarily makes them true. Harris, the truth value of a proposition can be evaluated whether or not this is a fact worth knowing or whether or not it's dangerous to know. Peterson, no, but that's the thing I don't agree with because I think that's the kind of conception of what constitutes a fact that does in fact present a moral danger to people, a mortal danger to people. And I also think that that's partly why the scientific endeavor, as it's demolished the traditional underpinnings of our moral systems, has produced an emergent nihilism and hopelessness among people that makes them more susceptible to ideological possession. I think it's a fundamental problem. And I do believe that the highest truths, let's put it that way, the highest truths are moral truths. I'm thinking about that from a Darwinian perspective. Harris, who is a slippery customer himself, spends most of the interview just trying to nail Peterson down to a coherent definition of truth, but has less success than a Republican trying to get Bill Clinton to define what the meaning of is, is. Harris, I would expect many people will share my frustration that you're not granting what seems to be just fairly obvious and undeniable facts, and now we were having to use this concept of truth in a pretty inconvenient way, right? because I don't see how anyone is going to think that it makes sense. Peterson, you know, look, fine, of course it's going to be controversial. I mean, the claim I'm making is that scientific truth is nested inside moral truth, and moral truth is the final adjudicator. And your claim is no, moral truth is nested inside scientific truth, and scientific truth is the final adjudicator. It's like, fine, you know, those are both our coherent positions. Harris, 
but yours actually isn't coherent. Peterson, realizing how bad this exchange made him look, eventually came up with a master plan to explain away his very public philosophical de-pantsing, which he unveiled on The Joe Rogan Show. This turned out to be a spectacularly unwise decision as he went from the frying pan into the blast furnace with his now infamously laughable claim to have gone 600 hours without sleep. What is particularly interesting about Peterson's attempt to cover up his self-immolation at the hands of a media ally is not the inherent absurdity of his claims or the childish nature of his lies, but rather the way in which he obviously seeks to retroactively revise the narrative of the debate. His behavior is very much like that of the high school student who receives a disappointing score on the SAT and blames his poor performance on partying too hard the night before, except in Peterson's case, it is more akin to blaming his poor performance on having been abducted and ritually abused for two weeks by demonic time-traveling aliens who returned him to Earth just five minutes before the test. Lest you think I exaggerate, Consider the following dialogue from Peterson's appearance on the Joe Rogan Experience, number 1139, on July 18th, 2018. Peterson. The worst response I think we're allergic to, or allergic, whatever the hell this is having an inflammatory response to something called sulfites. And we had some apple cider that has sulfites in it, and that was really not good, like I was done for a month. That was the first time I talked to Sam Harris. Rogan. You were done for a month? Peterson. Oh, yeah. It took me out for a month. It was awful. Yeah, yeah. Rogan. So this is right before this whole truth conversation with Sam Harris that got stuck in the mud? Peterson. During. During. It was, I think, the day I talked to Sam was like the worst day of my life, not because of talking to Sam. Rogan. Just physical? Peterson. Jesus, I was so dead, but I didn't want to not do it. There's no way I could have lived like that if that would have lasted for... See, Michaela knew by that point that it would probably only last a month. And I was like, Rogan, a month from fucking cider? Peterson. Well, I didn't sleep that, that month. I didn't sleep for 25 days. I didn't sleep at all. I didn't sleep at all for 25 days. Rogan. How is that possible? Peterson. I'll tell you how it's possible. You lay in bed, frozen in something approximating terror for eight hours, and then you get up. Ironically, given the likelihood that Rogan was attempting to help Peterson sweep his abysmal performance with Sam Harris under the rug, it was probably his interruption and emphasis on the word month that caused Peterson's auto-mirroring habit to kick in and prompt him to apply that particular unit of time to the period of sleeplessness he was intending to declare as he did when he was lying about his decision to deplatform Faith Goldie, Peterson demonstrates his customary tell when he describes how he didn't sleep that, that month, and then repeats, and then repeats his false claim three times. Again, remember that Jordan Peterson claims to choose his words very, very carefully. But what we are seeing in the Rogan dialogue is the work of a habitual deceiver, a con man in action, constantly scanning his target for clues that he can mirror in order to successfully convince the target of his sincerity and veracity. The Eighth Principle of Jordanetics You can speak a new world into existence through your lies. Chapter 14 Schrodinger's Rape Quote, Peterson doesn't like the question, Do you believe in the divinity of Jesus? For the same reasons, he doesn't like the question, do you believe in God? It all depends on what you mean by believe and divinity. End quote. Dr. Greg Boyd. Rule number nine. Assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. A very close reading of rule number nine is necessary because due to the deceptive manner in which it is presented, its true nature has been completely missed by Peterson's fans. As usual, the explicit rule appears to consist of a very basic truism. Namely, the person with whom you are engaged in conversation may possess information that you do not. This is not merely a safe assumption. It borders on tautology. Literally everyone to whom you speak and to whom you listen knows something that you do not 
even if it is something as mundane as what the other person ate for breakfast. Assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. As straightforward as this advice appears to be, nearly every significant word in the sentence proves to have a double meaning. Peterson begins explaining the ninth rule with a long story about a patient who is uncertain as to whether or not she was raped five times. He describes her as being extremely vague and unprepossessing to the point of being a ghost. At the same time, she was also sufficiently Machiavellian to arrange to be appointed to an important government advisory board despite knowing nothing about government, consulting, or the subject on which she was advising. She had never held a real job, but hosted a radio show about small business and had been on welfare all her life. Peterson, understandably, is not terribly sympathetic to this manipulative grifter. It takes one to know one, after all, and by his own account, it soon becomes clear that Peterson has no intention of helping the woman he describes as a denizen of chaos and the underworld, a walking disaster, and Nietzsche's pale criminal. She has no interest in enlightenment, and his central Jungian ethic is not to help the tormented in hell, but merely to study them in order to understand their pain. Peterson considers his two options, to help her to understand that she was raped, or to help her understand that she was not raped. He considers that the former would simplify her life, but the latter might help her change it. He contemplates his own perspective on the matter, musing that if he were an adherent of a left-wing social justice ideology, he would tell her that she was raped. But if he were an adherent of a conservative ideology, he would tell her that she was not raped. And in either case, he declares, her response would prove his judgment to be true, at least for Petersonian values of truth. So, as you have probably come to expect by now, Peterson does neither. He chooses neither the chaos of rape nor the order of not rape, but instead chooses to merely listen, leaving her in an indeterminate state of Schrodinger's rape, where she still didn't know if she'd been raped, and neither did he. Life, Jordan Peterson explains, is very complicated. It is especially complicated when one does not know what the meaning of is is. But at least, Peterson reassures us, even though he did absolutely nothing and failed to help his patient in any way, she did not leave his office as the living embodiment of what he describes as his damned ideology. Those are Peterson's own words, his own damned ideology, and they are revelatory indeed. It's a damning confession, too, given how Peterson repeatedly claims to be post-ideological, having left all ideologies behind in response to his despair at the petty envy and superficiality of his fellow Socialist Party members. Quote, I had outgrown the shallow Christianity of my youth by the time I could understand the fundamentals of Darwinian theory. After that, I could not distinguish the basic elements of Christian belief from wishful thinking. The socialism that soon afterward became so attractive to me as an alternative proved equally insubstantial. End quote. Twelve Rules for Life But it is not Peterson's ideology that is damnable. It is his philosophy. Peterson chooses to leave Miss S. in a state of confusion, in a twenty-year hell, never knowing for certain whether she was raped five times or not but he explains that he does this for her own good. His inaction is justified because the only way that she can obtain the answer that will enlighten her is by crawling through the roots of the underworld and discovering for herself the self-knowledge that is her pragmatic Darwinian survival-enhancing truth. What is the utility of the mere objective truth concerning the actual historical fact of what really happened compared to that? Peterson's Jungian approach to therapy here is unconventional, to put it mildly, and it has considerably more in common with a Scientology auditing session than it does with a conventional counseling session. Forget the three times Peterson has been accused of sexual improprieties by his students. It's a wonder that he is still allowed to commit psychology on his unsuspecting patients. So, what does all of this non-therapy have to do with listening to people who might know something you don't? 
In Peterson's example, Peterson is the listener and Miss S is the person to whom he is listening. It can be assumed that Miss S had to have known the answer to the question that Peterson didn't. She was there on all five occasions, and presumably she had at least some inkling of what actually happened each time. Nevertheless, Peterson declares that his patient would have needed to discuss the historical events for at least 20 years in order to figure out whether she had been raped or not. In fact, he explicitly argues that the truth could not be known, because there is no objective truth of the matter capable of being known. Quote, there was no way of knowing the objective truth, and there never would be. There was no objective observer, and there never would be. There was no complete and accurate story. Such a thing did not and could not exist. End quote. Twelve Rules for Life Notice the subtle contradictions encapsulated here in these five sentences. The truth is that there were, in fact, at least two observers to the objective act of rape or not rape. The fact that they would not necessarily be objective observers is irrelevant to the objective fact of the observed act having taken place or not. Furthermore, the first sentence of the quote clearly implies that an objective truth exists. The problem is merely that it could not be determined due to the lack of objectivity of the observers. Just two sentences later, however, Peterson contradicts himself by asserting that a complete and accurate story, which is to say the objective truth of what happened, did not and could not exist. The outrageous thing that Peterson is suggesting here is that the thing neither he knows, his patient knows, the thing that did not and could not exist is therefore not damaging to his patient. Whatever the long-term damage of these possible rapes might be, it can be ameliorated by a victim's ignorance of the actual facts. Thus, even if Miss S was raped on one of those five occasions, actually knowing whether she was or was not raped is not particularly important. Whether the acts were real or not, they are now part of her past, and she should instead be focused on the future. But how can she possibly focus on the future when she does not know the foundation for it that the past provides? Furthermore, if the question, was I raped, is sufficiently significant for it to consume multiple therapy sessions, let alone 20 years of therapy, how is she supposed to simply ignore it and move on? On the other hand, Peterson is aware of the possibility that the thing his patient knows that he does not is that she was not actually raped. She is a confirmed grifter, after all, and it is far from impossible that her unknown motive was to entice her psychologist into substantiating a false rape narrative that she had created. Given the fact that Jordan Peterson has thrice been falsely accused of sexual improprieties himself, this would be a possibility that he simply could not rule out. So Peterson dodges her bullet by listening without even trying to help her clarify what happened to her. While this would be a perfectly reasonable approach if the patient was a liar, Peterson readily admits that he does not know that to be the case. Of course, if she wasn't searching for a false rape accusation and had, in fact, been a five-time rape victim, Peterson's refusal to help her in any substantial way callously condemns the woman to decades of questions, self-condemnation, and emotional insecurity. How can he possibly justify this inaction and professional irresponsibility? Is it really so important that he is not mistaken for an SJW or a conservative? Is it really so vital that she not be transformed into the embodiment of his damned ideology? What is the point of seeing a psychologist who refuses to help you? These questions are beyond us, but one that is not is what this very strange episode has to do with the rule about listening, and what exactly is the nature of the damned ideology from which he is protecting her? What ideology is so damnable that it would harm someone who has already been raped as many as five times? The answer is provided by the application of the earlier rules. The patient is the archetype of the low-status lobster. She is a vague, non-existent denizen of chaos. Whether she has really been victimized or not, she does not merit Peterson's help. Whether he confirms her rape or he establishes her lies, she remains incapable of standing up straight and rising to the more perfect order of the middle way. 
But now that the reader has advanced further along the 12 rule path, Peterson can explain how you can do more than simply extricate yourself from any unseemly connections to low status friends. Now you can make use of the unfortunate individuals. First, ensure that the person to whom you are listening is a low status lobster. He needs to be one who is likely to remain entrapped in the disorder and chaos of hell below. Someone who can't be redeemed or isn't worth redeeming. Someone who, in your younger days, before Jordanetics, might have been capable of dragging you down with him. Second, assume that the individual to whom you are listening is keeping a secret. It's not that the thing he knows may consist of new and useful knowledge, something from which you can learn and grow. To the contrary, the secret he possesses is most likely irrelevant to you. The important thing is that you can use the secret he has shared with you to improve your standing, with him or with others. Third, do your best to avoid expressing any personal opinion of the secret once it is shared with you. Avoid even mentioning it if you can. By leaving the secret unspoken and leaving its sharer in the dark about your understanding of his secret, you are now able to exert power over him and possibly even over others as well, by using your new secret knowledge as leverage. The less you speak about what you know, the more uncertainty you create in the minds of others and the more power you hold over them. This is why the ninth rule necessarily comes so far along the twelve rule path, because it consists of a complex application of several of the preceding rules that need to be understood and successfully applied before one can even begin to comprehend it let alone utilize it. And while it may strike some readers as cruel and exceedingly manipulative, when taken in the context of the preceding rules, it is the natural extension of the narcissistic principles of Jordanetics. The ninth rule would be much better understood if or worded in a more straightforward manner. Any secret shared with you is a potential means of elevating your standing in the dominance hierarchy, and the way you use knowledge to increase your standing is to keep it to yourself. Thus we arrive at another paradox of Jordanetics. Conversation is conspiracy, but the victim of this conspiracy is the person with whom you are having the conversation. The ninth principle of Jordanetics, dominate the conversation and control the narrative by keeping your mouth shut. Chapter 15 speaking madness into being. Quote, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. End quote. Dr. Jordan Peterson. Rule number 10. Be precise in your speech. This rule will likely strike the reader of this book as one that borders on parody, given what he now knows about the nature of Peterson's careless and deceit-filled speech. In case it is not entirely obvious from the various quotes from Peterson's books and public appearances scattered throughout the book, Peterson is an almost comically imprecise speaker. Ask ten different Peterson fans what he means by something, and you will almost invariably be provided with at least eight different definitions, most of them contradictory. There are a whole host of Peterson memes floating around the internet, but perhaps the most entertaining is a parody of the Nike ad starring ex-NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick, celebrated for his principled decision to kneel during the national anthem played prior to the kickoff at football games. The Nike ad says, Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. The Peterson parody says, It depends on what you mean by believe. It depends on what you mean by sacrifice. Throughout the book, Peterson has repeatedly indicated in a variety of ways that he does not believe in anything that can be considered objective reality, but in the chapter devoted to Rule 10, he leaves even the most skeptical reader with no doubts in this regard. For example, because laptop computers eventually become obsolete, Peterson decides that their nature is transient, like the leaf that crumbles and dissolves within a matter of weeks. Because they can connect to the internet and run applications hosted elsewhere, laptops can only maintain their computer-like facade for but a few short years. I believe that Basho, the great Japanese poet, 
wrote a haiku concerning this very matter. Obsolete laptop. Outdated. Are you still even a PC? What Peterson argues is that because material things decay and become obsolete, they are not really things, or at least not the objects that we superficially consider them to be. He argues, quite literally, that a car is neither a thing nor an object, but merely a transportation device. He briefly considers the grammatical arguments to the contrary, but ultimately dismisses it, because what are the mere rules of linguistic grammar to a master of the balance who has transcended both objective reality and sanity? Peterson spends several pages redefining objects and things as non-objects and non-things, based on the reasoning that because our perceptions are limited and we do not observe these objects and things with perfect omniscience, they obviously do not exist. This rule is significant because it explains the central paradox of Jordan Peterson. How can he possibly claim to choose his words very, very carefully when he so often says things that are manifestly absurd? How can he assert the value of truth when telling shameless lies? Why does he urge precision in one's speech when he himself speaks in such a torturous, meandering, and incoherent manner? The answer is simple. Peterson is attempting to avoid scaring the women and children with the true nature of his philosophy. The masses are not ready to accept the idea that neither God, nor reality, nor truth actually exist. Therefore, it is necessary to very carefully conceal one's true meaning beneath a fog of word salad that confuses all but the most worthy. In order to maintain his dominance, the philosopher must conceal his secret, because as soon as it is revealed in a straightforward manner, everyone will understand that all Peterson has to offer is warmed over occult Gnosticism. A secret remains at its most powerful when it has not yet been revealed. But there is even more than this to understand. Now that the nine previous rules have put the postulant of the twelve-rule path through the philosophical rigors required and prepared him for life, he is ready to face the real challenge of transforming philosophy into a magic that is capable of transforming words into an experiential reality that suits the magician's narrative. Not unlike a wizard counseling his acolyte, Peterson argues that we be very careful of our words as we summon the demons that will impose our will onto existence. What Peterson is teaching here is the transformation of reality through speech, of changing the world through the magical combination of word and will. Crowley expressed the same concept in a more succinct manner. Quote, Magic is the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. End quote. James Fraser's classic guide to occult thinking, The Golden Bow, explained this particular brand of magic. Quote, Whenever sympathetic magic occurs in its pure, unadulterated form, it is assumed that in nature, one event follows another necessarily and invariably without the intervention of any spiritual or personal agency. Thus, its fundamental conception is identical with that of modern science. Underlying the whole system is a faith, implicit but real and firm, in the order and uniformity of nature. The magician does not doubt that the same causes will always produce the same effects that the performance of the proper ceremony accompanied by the appropriate spell will inevitably be attended by the desired results, unless, indeed, his incantations should chance to be thwarted and foiled by the more potent charms of another sorcerer. He supplicates no higher power. He sues the favor of no fickle and wayward being. He abases himself before no awful deity. Yet his power, great as he believes it to be, is by no means arbitrary and unlimited. He can wield it only so long as he strictly conforms to the rules of his art, or to what may be called the rules of nature as conceived by him. To neglect these rules, to break these laws in the smallest particular, is to incur failure, and may even expose the unskillful practitioner himself to the utmost peril." End quote. James Fraser, The Golden Bow. Hence the importance of precision, one must be very careful indeed to get all of the words of the spell correct, lest the reality one creates turn out to be even more of a hell than the one it replaced. 
Peterson warns of the possibility of error and advises his metaphorical apprentice how to address a spell gone wrong. Quote, When something goes wrong, even perception itself must be questioned, along with evaluation, thought, and action. When error announces itself, undifferentiated chaos is at hand. Its reptilian form paralyzes and confuses. But dragons, which do exist, perhaps more than anything else exists, also hoard gold. In that collapse into the terrible mess of uncomprehended being lurks the possibility of new and benevolent order. Clarity of thought, courageous clarity of thought, is necessary to call it forth." End quote. It is here that Peterson identifies how the Tenth Rule empowers his student to impose his will upon reality, to give structure to chaos, and re-establish order through one's speech. By speaking carefully, by speaking precisely, we can reorder reality to our preference. But should we speak carelessly or imprecisely, the spell will not work. Or worse, it will transform reality into an even more dangerous and hostile place. Crowley's spells were defined in a similar manner. Quote, Illustration It is my will to inform the world of certain facts within my knowledge. I therefore take magical weapons, pen, ink, and paper. I write incantations, these sentences, in the magical language, i.e., that which is understood by the people I wish to instruct. I call forth spirits, such as printers, publishers, booksellers, and so forth, and constrain them to convey my message to those people. The composition and distribution of this book is thus an act of magic, by which I cause changes to take place in conformity with my will." End quote. Alistair Crowley, Magic. Time and time and time again throughout Rule 10, Peterson asserts that the use of precise and specific words in the face of chaos will prove to be its antidote. Peterson considers precise speech the sort of speech that makes material manifest, that isolates and separates things from their unknowable histories, to be a white magic. With the tenth rule, Peterson provides the initiate with more than just the means to survive amid the suffering of the world, he provides him with the means to transcend the very reality of the world with his words. The tenth principle of Jordanetics. Transcend the material world by very carefully choosing the words that will alter its reality. Chapter 16. Skateboards and Sacrifice. Quote, the mysterious and seemingly irrational sacrificial ritual actually dramatizes or acts out two critically important and related ideas. First, that the essence of man, that is, the divine aspect, must constantly be offered up to the unknown, must present itself voluntarily to the destructive slash creative power that constitutes the Great Mother, incarnation of the unpredictable, as we have seen, and second, that the thing that is loved best must be destroyed, that is, sacrificed, in order for the positive aspect of the unknown to manifest itself. End quote. Dr. Jordan Peterson. Rule number 11. Do not bother children when they are skateboarding. Rule 11 is a particularly tricky one. Peterson spreads truth liberally in the bait he offers to the casual reader, to the point that even Peterson's most cynical critic may be tempted to give this rule a passing grade. After all, who doesn't agree with the idea of letting kids be kids? But while Peterson has a tendency to play a devious little game of two truths and a lie throughout the Twelve Rules for Life, in this chapter he turns that tendency up to literally eleven. Two truths and a lie is a game commonly used to break the ice, in which one person tells everyone three facts about themselves, and the rest of the players try to guess which one is not true. It is a good way to learn some memorable things about a person, but the game would not be much of a game if the player never revealed their lie to the others. Instead of breaking the ice and learning a couple of interesting facts about a person, everyone would be left with nothing but possibly false narratives about one another. His opening story concerns a group of reckless skateboarders near his workplace and how the University of Toronto was able to put a stop to them in the name of safety by installing skate stoppers whose sheer harsh ugliness 
makes a lie of the reasons for its implementation, end quote. Identifying this bureaucratic urge to control skateboarders as a sort of Jungian evil twin of public safety and public concern, he illustrates how the social justice dispensing front is more concerned with looking good than with doing good. He writes how The Road to Wigan Pier by George Orwell was a socialist critique of the average educated socialist who was usually much less concerned for the poor than he was jealous of the rich. This behavior can be described as the evil twin in action. A passionate, even selfless cause often serves as cover for a different, more nefarious motive. Peterson reminds the reader of Jung's admonition, which he describes as a surgically wicked psychoanalytic dictum, which is to look at the consequences and infer the motivation if you are puzzled as to why someone did something. Peterson's point is, on its face, a fairly obvious one. Just because someone says they are acting from high principles for the good of others, there is no reason to take them at face value. That's true, just as there is no reason to believe someone who says he is choosing his words very, very carefully, or considering the matter for the first time, is necessarily telling the truth. So what is the secret purpose of Rule 11, if it is not simply about leaving boys free to skateboard where they want? It is about facing your own evil twin. And who is your evil twin? Why, it is none other than your former self. It is you, before you rose above the chaos. It is you, when you were still trapped by your limiting friendships. It is you, before you learned to cast spells. In short, it is you before you learned how to apply Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. Peterson confirms this reading in his subsequent illustrative examples. He follows the example of the anti-skater bureaucrat with his broken homicidal suicidal friend Chris, an anti-human professor's lecture, and finishes with the world-hating Columbine shooters. These archetypical evil twins are people who claimed they wanted to make the world a better place, but went about it by taking negative action against the world's inhabitants. Chris, Peterson's childhood friend, is the most obvious expression of Peterson's own evil twin and former self. Chris comes from the same background as Peterson, experienced the sympathetic antagonism with the local natives, struggled to escape their small town, pursued the same woman, and battled the same dangerous and deadly mental illness as Peterson. Chris's life directly mirrored Peterson's life, and it was not until Peterson metaphorically left him behind for good following Chris's suicide, that he finally managed to dispel his evil twin's presence. The evil twin is not only the negative mirror of the enlightened being, he is a symbol of that being's death. Peterson calls them self-appointed judges of the human race. They are the speakers behind the critical voices with whom you must negotiate, as per the fourth rule. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. The goal is to put the evil twin behind you once and for all. But what does that mean? To understand that, we must first grasp the origin of the self as mirrored twins, the children of the ancient symbol of the terrible mother that Peterson spends so much of this chapter discussing. The terrible mother is Tiamat. She is the mother of all things. She gives birth to both men and gods. She is nature. She is the unknown and she is chaos. She is the spirit of carelessness and of unconsciousness. She is represented by the dragon and by the snake, both of whom dwell in the underworld. So, obviously, she represents oppression, specifically oppression of a female variety. His point here is that society will create monsters out of healthy men if it tries too hard to control them. This is not a particularly deep insight, considering that Princess Leia made a similar observation to the Grand Moff Tarkin in the movie Star Wars, but it is extremely informative to see how Peterson describes these monsters as harsh, fascist supporters of Donald Trump and the sinister far-right parties on the rise in Holland, Sweden, and Norway. Even worse, we are informed they particularly enjoy the movies Iron Man and Fight Club, which tells the reader who is familiar with the actual novel by Chuck Palahniuk that the famous psychiatrist genuinely doesn't know the latter is not about fighting or fascism, 
but a metaphorical journey into the homosexual underground. So, your evil twin is a tyrant, a god emperor, a fascist with a friendly face. It is not openly evil. It does not display itself as an ideological, murderous, right-wing nationalist wearing lightning bolts and swastikas. Instead, this excessively masculine evil dresses itself up as a bleeding-heart radical leftist. Your evil twin is inclined to commit evil in the name, but not the spirit, of proper leftist motives. Your true self is more naturally liberal, sensitive but not radical, moderate, not extreme. Right-wing nationalism is naked evil, usually in reaction to the absence of healthy leftism and the oppressive presence of unhealthy leftism. Fraser's The Golden Bough emphasizes the importance of sacrifice and the human scapegoat in antiquity. The scapegoat, according to Fraser, took many forms and its rituals varied from culture to culture and situation to situation. It was not always a human being. It was not always a living thing. In fact, the scapegoat was not necessarily even a material thing. But the general concept was that the scapegoat was always used as a means of using a substitute to purge evil from the individual or the community. In other words, a scapegoat was either a lure to draw demons or other evil spirits out of a person or place, or an innocent creature, person, or thing that served as a symbol for evil, but at its highest form, it always represented a holy human sacrifice. In other words, even if the scapegoat was a literal goat, its slaughter, symbolic or actual, represented the death of a priest king or even a god. When the Golden Bough was originally published, it caused great scandal, primarily because in the midst of all the pagan rites and folk tales, it included an entire chapter on Jesus Christ and the crucifixion. Scholars and theologians alike excoriated the text for its shoddy historicity, and the faithful correctly recognized it as blasphemy. Later editions removed the chapter on Christianity, but the original implication that Jesus Christ was merely another archetype of the dying God motif remains. Many anthropologists of his time attacked Fraser for his poor scholarship, but he defended his work as mere speculation and hoped it would eventually be replaced by a more soundly grounded successor. But it was not. The Golden Bough's influence, both as a work of the occult and of creative expression, remains to this day, and Fraser's interpretation of the scapegoat, including the idea that Jesus Christ was nothing more than the echo of an ancient pagan ritual, are among its most persistent falsehoods. The significance here is that human sacrifice, or more specifically, a particular kind of human sacrifice serving as a quasi-divine scapegoat is the pinnacle of the esoteric magic used in occult spellcasting influenced by Fraser's work. Being an esotericist himself, Jordan Peterson meditates on sacrifice throughout the Twelve Rules for Life, and his primary example is human sacrifice. Peterson emphasizes that this sort of human sacrifice is the opposite of what he regards as proper sacrifice, but acknowledges that even a proper sacrifice, if a failure, could result in cold-blooded, religion-motivated, bloody murder. In Jordanetics, human sacrifice of the holy innocent is both the lowest evil and the highest good. As above, so below. Recall what Peterson says of the near homicides that occurred in his house due to the supernaturally unsettling presence of Chris, his mirrored self and evil twin. Quote, the spirit of Cain had visited our house, but we were left unscathed. End quote. Twelve Rules for Life. Peterson has already established himself as a Christ figure through his sufferings in the desert and his visions of crucifixion. He has established Chris as his evil twin. And in his final self-destructive act, Chris Kane serves as the archetypical scapegoat, the human sacrifice that purges the evil from the Jordan Christ. The symbolic ritual of human sacrifice has other important roles to play in Jordanetics. It includes this kind of duality, where the sacrifice may be proper or improper, committed by unholy Chris, or performed on holy Chris. But it is more than that. The dying God, sacrificed, slaughtered, dead, and reborn, of course, doesn't have to be a sentient entity. It could be a mammoth, 
which is a god because it is viewed as a gift from God or a god. It could be harvested grain, which symbolizes the vision-giving fruit gift from the serpent and or god. It could be one's personal ambition in exchange for a social good. Peterson's examples are numerous, but his chief illustration of the occult dying god scapegoat is in what he calls Jesus Christ slash Horus, the word. Jesus Christ is portrayed as the good sacrifice of the proper type, just as Abel is the good, ideal, and innocent sacrifice, but Cain's part in it is the evil, vengeful, and improper. That means that such a good sacrifice of the word has a mirror, an evil twin. Peterson views the Holocaust as that other side. The Holocaust is deemed an evil and improper sacrifice, just as Cain's slaying of Abel to spite God was evil and improper. But more ominously and troubling, Peterson declares that the great human sacrifice of the Holocaust fulfilled a holy purpose. There was a spiritual reason for it. Quote, it is something more like atonement for the criminal fact of your fractured and damaged being. It's payment of the debt you owe for the insane and horrible miracle of your existence. It's how you remember the Holocaust. It's how you make amends for the pathology of history. It's adoption for the responsibility for being a potential denizen of hell. It is willingness to serve as an angel of paradise." End quote. 12 Rules for Life From Peterson's dualistic perspective, it ultimately doesn't matter whether the Holocaust was a good and proper sacrifice or an evil and improper one. What matters is that the sacrifice is remembered, that the burnt offering of millions of innocents, regardless of the evil motive behind it, redeems the being of the spirit of man and reconnects those who remember it to the soaring, detached freedom of the skies above the pyramids. The cornerstone of Peterson's philosophy is that suffering is real and that taking action that causes suffering is wrong. So whether Peterson's self-confessed obsession with the Holocaust is ultimately satanic or saintly, the important thing is that the sacrifice occurred so that it could be remembered. When Peterson recognizes his own capacity to torture children in a dungeon, he is projecting himself into the place of the pagan high priest during the ritual human sacrifice of the dying god. So, to summarize, your evil twin is your former self the identity from which you have disassociated yourself. You are the good twin, the enlightened being, the positive side of the mirror. If you have followed the rules very carefully, refrained from action, and chosen your words with sufficient precision, then you have thwarted the god-emperor within, and now it falls to you to defend and uphold a society that thwarts the chaos of tyrants and identity politics and nationalism. This can only be done by sacrificing the evil twin. You can't actually kill your evil twin, of course. It's bad luck to break mirrors and your evil twin is protected by its ability to hide in your past. Even so, you can't just let it rattle the bars of its psychological prison until eventually it breaks free and unmakes all of your hard-earned progress along the middle way. The imperative of the eleventh rule is a ritual sacrifice, not a literal one, not a literal one and the sacrifice involved refers to the integration of the former self with its successor, resulting in a being that is finally in balance. To explain this integration, Peterson refers to the old Charles Atlas ads in the back of comic books, where the weakling hero, Mac, is publicly bullied and rendered undesirable to women. But after working out, he defeats his former bullies and wins the affections of the girl. Mac's evil twin is not the bully, but rather his former self, the weakling. And so we see that integration is transformation. As with so many other concepts, Peterson derived this rule of transformation through integration from Jung, who considered this question of integrating good and evil at length in his alchemical studies. Quote, For as long as Satan is not integrated, the world is not healed and man is not saved. But Satan represents evil, and how can evil be integrated? There is only one possibility, to assimilate it. That is to say, raise it to the level of consciousness. This is done by means of a very complicated symbolic process, which is more or less identical with the psychological process of individuation. In alchemy, this is called the conjunction of two principles. End quote. Carl Jung, 
memories, dreams, reflections. So what Peterson actually means by don't bother children is don't sacrifice children to the gods, which really means fixing the world through assimilation rather than action. The 11th principle of Jordanetics, heal the world by assimilating its evil. Chapter 17, How a Saint Surmounts Suffering Quote, Evil requires sacrifices. Evil gets off on an individual's willingness to give up life. It's a craving of your own sacrifice. You have to make the choice or else evil doesn't appreciate it. The free will requirement of good is very similar to evil. If you don't give up your own integrity or your own righteousness or the love of your family, evil isn't really as interested in it. They're trying to get you to choose it. End quote. Owen Benjamin Rule number 12. Pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. The final rule in 12 Rules for Life in many ways exemplifies Peterson's Jungian practice of suspending his critical judgment. While he has toyed with the poor, overmatched reader all throughout the book, here he is at his most brazen, changing his definitions and subjects around with the casual ease of a Las Vegas blackjack dealer distributing cards, whipsawing his bewildered audience most of whom by now have been battered into numbed intellectual submission. If you harbor a cruel streak and want to amuse yourself, ask a Peterson fan to explain the twelfth rule to you. The look of confusion and dismay when it dawns upon them that they retain literally nothing from the climactic chapter of this book they hold to be so meaningful is what the beginning of knowledge looks like. Again, as the cynic has come to anticipate, even though cats are the object of Rule 12, Peterson spends most of the chapter focusing on dogs instead. He does this, he explains, because he doesn't wish to be found guilty of minimal group identification, a phenomenon we are informed was discovered by a social psychologist named Henry Todgefell. It's important to observe that while Peterson refuses to recognize the objective reality of mundane non-things such as laptop computers and the transportation devices known as cars, historical events such as rape or the crucifixion, let alone more abstract concepts such as truth, Jesus, and God, he believes very strongly in the reality of ideas that spring out of the imagination of 19th and 20th century European psychologists. Tafjell is chiefly known for analyzing the intellectual aspects of prejudice and social identity theory, which is another way of saying that he was a Polish Jew obsessed with producing a scientific-sounding explanation for why the World War II-era Germans hated the Jews. Wikipedia informs us that Tafjell believed social psychologists should seek to address serious social problems by examining how psychological dimensions interact with historical, ideological, and cultural factors, which goes a long way towards explaining why Peterson regards him as an authority. Peterson elaborates on the psychological studies that claim to demonstrate two things that are seemingly contradictory. On the one hand, people are social. On the other, people are antisocial. People are social because they like the members of their own group. People are antisocial because they don't like the members of other groups. Recall, however, that Peterson wants you to be wary of groups, that it is only the individual who ultimately matters. So Peterson's dualist perspective comes in handy here. As you have probably already ascertained, being social represents order, while being antisocial represents chaos. This is our confirmation that Peterson is engaging in the usual esoteric double-talk in which the superficial meaning applies to the normal reader, but holds a deeper meaning for the enlightened initiate. Peterson is barely even trying to hide his double talk at this point, as he asserts that the discovery of minimal conditions in the 1950s explains why he began a cat-related chapter with a description of his dog, and promptly began talking about a third and unrelated subject. Even the most generous reader who still doubts the existence of the mystical level of Peterson's book will be forced to admit here that Peterson has become utterly incoherent as he descends into baffle garble. This is the one point at which even Peterson's most loyal fans will tend to agree with him 
when he declares that he doesn't know what the hell he is talking about. And it's not even correct for Peterson to describe the chapter as being cat-related, as he devotes all of three paragraphs to the behavior of cats and the benefits of petting them. If you still don't understand that Peterson is not writing about what he pretends to be writing about, I don't know what more could possibly be cited to convince you than this example of Peterson simply not writing about cats at all. Quote, In any case, it is because of Tajfell's minimal conditions discovery that I began this cat-related chapter with a description of my dog. Otherwise, the mere mention of a cat in the title would be enough to turn many dog people against me, just because I didn't include canines in the group of entities that should be petted. Since I also like dogs, there is no reason for me to suffer such a fate. So if you like to pet dogs when you meet them on the street, don't feel obliged to hate me. Rest assured instead that this is also an activity of which I approve. I would also like to apologize to all the cat people who now feel slighted because they were hoping for a cat story but had to read all this dog-related material. Perhaps they might be satisfied by some assurance that cats do illustrate the point I want to make better and that I will eventually discuss them. First, however, to other things. End quote. Twelve Rules for Life. His concerns that he might annoy the cat-loving reader, while overly dramatic, are not entirely misplaced. Although the lack of connection between the promise implied in the rule and what is delivered in the text of the chapter is standard practice throughout each of the twelve rules, there is simply no connection at all between the subject of this rule for life and the chapter itself. Lobsters may not share common ancestry with humans, and the asserted implications of their dominance hierarchy for the human social hierarchy may not be as relevant as Peterson believes, but at least Peterson spends some time actually discussing lobsters in the lobster-related chapter. He may not provide a single example of picking friends who want the best for him, but at least he shows the depressing consequences of his having chosen poorly in the friend-related chapter. He may criticize the world despite his own house being in imperfect order in violation of his own sixth rule, but at least he discusses houses in the house-related chapter. But even the most generous reader cannot let Peterson off the hook in this cat-related chapter, because whatever their merits may be, and whatever benefits petting them might bring, cats are not dogs, and they definitely are not his daughter Michaela. Peterson's autobiographical perspective intensifies here as he shares with his reader the agonizing pain his beloved daughter suffered throughout her childhood as a result of severe polyarticular juvenile idiopathic arthritis affecting no less than 37 of her joints. She spent most of her childhood heavily medicated, beginning with codeine, then moved up to OxyContin when the codeine proved insufficient to control her pain. She was injected with drugs usually used in chemotherapy, Enbrel, and methotrexate to suppress her immune system, and was prescribed an SSRI antidepressant called Ciprolex for severe depression and anxiety at age 12. She actually ended up in a wheelchair at one point before finally being forced to get her hip and ankle replaced at the age of 17. His daughter's health catastrophe devastates the entire Peterson family. They are forced to traverse an underworld of almost unmitigated pain and suffering, a hell where every unexpected turn proves to be a bad one. Understandably, it causes Peterson to further question the faith he'd rejected as a child, as he wondered what sort of a sadistic god would create such a hellish world where such things could happen, especially to an innocent and happy little girl. And then, for seemingly no reason whatsoever, Peterson abruptly switches away from his daughter's litany of health disasters to a discussion of the 1938 creation of the cultural icon of Superman. But rather than, as might be expected, addressing the tragic roots of the comic book hero who is believed to have been born of a son's grief for his father, killed in a 1932 armed robbery, Peterson focuses on the terminal deus ex machina which tended to render an overpowered Superman boring to fans of the character. It is not until Superman is stripped of his more significant powers, such as his ability to shake off a nuclear attack or move an entire planet, does his story become interesting again. Being, Peterson concludes, appears to require limits. And furthermore, those limits apply to human reason as well. 
Quote, Something supersedes thinking, despite its truly awesome power. When existence reveals itself as existentially intolerable, thinking collapses in on itself. In such situations, in the depths, it's noticing, not thinking, that does the trick. Perhaps you might start by noticing this. When you love someone, it's not despite their limitations. It's because of their limitations. Of course, it's complicated. You don't have to be in love with every shortcoming and merely accept. You shouldn't stop trying to make life better or let suffering just be. But there appear to be limits on the path to improvement beyond which we might not want to go, lest we sacrifice our humanity itself. End quote. Twelve Rules for Life The good news is that Michaela not only survives her long battle with mental and physical illness, she goes on to marry, have a child, and even to launch a career as a dietary con woman, overselling the merits of an Atkins-style meat-only diet to cure a long litany of mental and physical ills, including, but not limited to, inflammation, gum disease, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease, excess weight, brain fog, anxiety, diabetes, ankylosing spondylitis, other types of arthritis, high blood pressure, depression, and fatigue. Considering what the young woman has been through, even a hardened skeptic like myself cannot find the necessary wherewithal to criticize or condemn her. And given the current percentage of the American and Canadian publics that are dangerously obese, it can be convincingly argued that whatever the shortcomings of the Michaela diet might be, the benefits it has to offer to a dangerously overweight society stuffing itself on far too many carbohydrates and sugars significantly outweigh them. Peterson closes the chapter by finally getting around to discussing the titular cats. The significance of cats to him is that they are a pure form of being, and more importantly, they are a manifestation of nature that actually approves of humanity. He suggests, therefore, that petting a cat is a reminder of the wonders of being that make up for the ineradicable suffering that accompanies it. The Twelfth Principle of Jordanetics to lift the world out of hell, you must be willing to accept its pain and suffering into yourself. Chapter 18. The Magical Pen of Light Quote, I'm a bad guy, but I'm trying not to be, and that's fucking something. End quote. Dr. Jordan Peterson Peterson has a lot of dreams and visions. He presents them as messages. Sometimes they are messages of hope. Sometimes they are dreadful warnings. But whenever he describes one, he never bothers to explain what he believes its meaning to be. He may go off onto a tangent he believes relates to the vision, but not even once does he follow up a vision with an interpretation. Every time he brings up a vision, he does so in a manner that indicates he intends for it to illustrate something to the reader but it always winds up coming off as a secret that he intends to keep to himself. That's because it is. One of the principles Peterson repeatedly asserts is to look at the consequences and determine a motive from them. This idea originally comes from Jung, but Peterson exercises it naturally and frequently throughout the Twelve Rules for Life. With that metric in mind, consider the motive behind Peterson's account of seeing a friend make use of a pen that emitted light from the tip so that one could write with it in the dark. Peterson, of course, views this device as deeply symbolic and meaningful in a personal sense, since he sees himself as a bringer of light to a humanity that is lost in darkness. So Peterson asks the friend to give him the pen. He is, by his own account, inordinately pleased when his friend dutifully obliges. His new ability to write illuminated words in the darkness delights Peterson, taken with the psychographic power of what he describes as his newfound pen of light, Peterson begins to ask questions of the pen and scribble down the answers it provides. When he describes being surprised by some of the mystical answers that he writes, it is clear that the insights he is recording are not his own. This is what is known as automatic writing. The approach is similar to the operator of an Ouija board in which the inquirer asks the questions consciously, but the answers purport to be provided without his conscious thought. 
Quote, Automatic writing, or psychography, is an alleged psychic ability allowing a person to produce written words without consciously writing. The words are claimed to arise from a subconscious, spiritual, or supernatural source. Automatic writing as a spiritual practice was reported by Hippolyte Ten in the preface to the third edition of his De Intelligent, published in 1878. Besides ethereal visions or magnetic auras, Fernando Pessoa claimed to have experienced automatic writing. He said he felt owned by something else, sometimes feeling a sensation in the right arm, which he claimed was lifted into the air without his will. William Fletcher Barrett wrote that automatic messages may take place either by the writer passively holding a pencil on a sheet of paper, or by the planchette, or by an Ouija board. In spiritualism, spirits are claimed to take control of the hand of a medium to write messages, letters, and even entire books. Automatic writing can happen in a trance or waking state. End quote. Wikipedia. A famous early episode of automatic writing came during the creation of Enochian magic in the 16th century. Occultists John Dee and Sir Edward Kelly used automatic writing to discover the celestial language of angels, which they referred to as the first language of God Christ. Another practitioner of automatic writing was the poet and author William Butler Yeats. He called it the automatic script. He utilized it extensively throughout his life. At first, he believed he was communing with the dead, but as he advanced in the practice, Yeats came to believe that the spirits he was drawing upon were, in fact, forms of his higher self. The most famous product of his deep automatic writing was Second Coming, which features the esoteric symbol of the gyre. The gyre is a three-dimensional spiral, which in motion forms a pyramid. It represents the movement from the earthly below of the everyday world to the pinnacle of enlightenment above. Through his automatic writing, Yeats discovered that the highest form of combined gyre represented the spirit. He named this gyre set the diamond and the hourglass, because that is what they look like, combined. This combination of gyres has eight directional points, similar to the cross of Scientology. Peterson is clearly familiar with both Yeats and Second Coming, as he cites it in Rule 10, Be Precise in Your Speech. Quote, what you least want to encounter will make itself manifest when you are weakest and it is strongest, and you will be defeated. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. End quote. William Butler Yeats, The Second Coming. Also similar to the cross of Scientology is the Crux and Santa, better known as the Rosy Cross of the Rosicrucian Order. According to Thelema, Alistair Crowley's psycho-spiritual religion, the cross's two parts are merged together, forming eight directional points, and the symbol of the eight-pointed Golden Dawn Cross shares so much in common with the cross of Scientology that it is difficult for the average person to tell them apart. There is no great mystery as to why. L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, praised Alistair Crowley as a great influence on him, and prior to founding Scientology, was a member of Crowley's Ordo Templi Orientalis. The rose at the center of the rosy cross symbolizes the ever-expanding goddess of the night named Nuit. The cross itself is called Hadit, the Lord of the Sky, who is the atomically contracted point of all things. These female and male components provide the believer the means with which to demonstrate the Godhead of his nature through the contemplation of opposites. And we're back to the middle way and the balance, again. Pyramids, gyres, rosy crosses, psychology, spiritualism, mysticism, occultic poetry, and pagan magics. How are they all related? Peterson again quotes Yeats in the poem that at first glance appears to be about the second coming of Jesus Christ, but actually anticipates the Antichrist. 
The images of the rocking cradle and the rough beast slouching ominously towards Bethlehem better anticipate the film's Rosemary's Baby and The Omen than Jesus Christ's martial return accompanied by all the hosts of heaven. Peterson does not quote from Yeats simply because he enjoys the man's poetry. In addition to being a talented wordsmith, William Butler Yeats was the great occult rival of Aleister Crowley. In 1900, Yeats, like Crowley, was a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Yeats, who himself had been kicked out of the occult theosophical society for experimenting too much with magic, was among the people in Golden Dawn who found Crowley's magic too dark for their tastes, so they kicked him out of the group. Crowley took great exception to this and targeted Yeats with several black magic attacks that eventually culminated in Yeats conjuring a vampire and sending it after Crowley. Or so it is reported. Now, however ridiculous you may find this stuff, the late gentleman certainly believed it, and Jordan Peterson at least appears to believe it too. He observably knows a lot more about it than he does about biology or Christian theology anyhow. Both Yeats and Crowley believed that the Taoist concept of yin and yang was a complementary symbol of the rosy cross, and Yeats explicitly tied his idea of gyres to the same concept. As you already know, Peterson's Twelve Rules are heavily focused on finding and maintaining the Taoist balance, and the cover of his first book, Maps of Meaning, features abstract artwork that portrays the eight points of the crux ansanta. Peterson's newfound pen of light, which, as per his habitual dishonesty, was not, in fact, found, but given in response to his blandishments, must be reconsidered in light of these long-established esoteric practices. The first question he asks the pen is what he is to do with it. After a lengthy discourse into the Bible, the nature of prayer, and Peterson's ideas of why God does not answer all prayers literally, he tells us that the pen's first response is to tell him to write down the words he wants inscribed on his soul. However, Peterson completely ignores this response, as, instead of writing down something meaningful, such as Roll Tide, John 3.16, or even Hail Abraxas, Prince of Hell, Devourer of Worlds, Great Beast Incarnate, and Dark Liege of the Unholy Army of the Dead, he simply treats his magic pen as if it were a gypsy fortune teller. What shall I do tomorrow? What shall I do next year? What shall I do with my life? What shall I do with my wife? What shall I do with the stranger? What shall I do with the torn nation? Peterson is again signaling his messiah complex and his dream to become the healer of the nations. He doesn't recognize that the nations are tearing themselves apart because of the very globalist ideology to which he owes his allegiance, and not even a magic pen can tell him how to repair the torn nation and stitch it back together by utilizing the very ideas that divided it in the first place. It is only at the very end of the book, in this coda to his twelve-rule path for life, that Peterson finally feels able to openly express his true purpose and announce his place among the pantheon of secret bodhisattvas on the middle way to balance and enlightenment. It should be clear by now that the twelve principles of Jordanetics are not just a spiritual gift that Peterson bestows upon his readers. They are also the rules for societal survival that the madman has applied to his own life. For the astute reader, the primary takeaway from Twelve Rules for Life should be a profound sense of dismay, because it is readily apparent that despite all the very lengthy contemplations and very, very careful articulations, Jordan Peterson's rules have not worked very well for Peterson himself. His autobiographical episodes are almost universally negative, ranging from the mildly depressing to the outright tragic. He has no friends. He has no peers. He has not surrounded himself with people who want the best for him. He spends far more time, space, and energy on telling us about his failures than about any of his successes. The book is chaotic and incoherent, full of vague and imprecise digressions where the details don't match up and the stories don't check out. One is left with the impression that Peterson's rules are useless for anyone who is remotely healthy and are very likely to cause more harm than good for the normal but low-status young men who could really use some good advice for how to live their lives, and worse, 
For those readers who are mentally unwell, the 12 rules for life will tend to feed the delusions of those who are already caught up in their imaginary subjective realities where they are not social rejects, but secret kings who see themselves as the real victors in every conflict or encounter. So the inevitable question is, why? Why does Peterson write his rules for life in this dualistic manner, prosaic and useless on one level, and esoteric and eccentric on the other? If he feels the need to promote an occultic spiritualism in the mode of Jung, Crowley, Yeats, and Hubbard, why not just come out and do so? It is not as if the Spanish Inquisition is going to burn him at the stake like Galileo or Giordano or Bruno. There are four obvious reasons. One, many intelligent readers are naturally very skeptical of esoteric teachings. The prophet, treating his newfound pen of light like an Ouija board, has no doubt paid a price in the past for speaking plainly about his wacky notions and quasi-religious nonsense. So, as a true believer in esoteric spiritualism, perhaps he has learned that the best approach with intelligent, independent-minded followers is one that buries its truths in misleading metaphors and confusing narratives. 2. Esoteric teachings, by nature, are convoluted, secretive, and masked by double meanings. The very term Gnosticism refers directly to secret knowledge. Carl Jung's Red Book, from which Peterson draws some of his own principles, was never published in his lifetime. In fact, it was such a private journal of collected esoterica that only very few of his closest associates ever saw any of its contents. It was never intended for general publication, and his legacy keepers prevented it from being published for decades after his death. 3. The Twelve Rule Path, being by nature esoteric, serves as a ritual of recognition for the highly enlightened. Many will come to the secret knowledge, but only the elite individuals capable of transcending the chaos of the lower masses and the ordered pyramids of the dominant in order to achieve their all-seeing status will understand it. 4. The Twelve Rule Path serves a dual purpose. A. The occult training of Peterson's most elite followers on their individual paths to spiritual enlightenment, and B. The establishment of Peterson as the secret prophet of the cult of Jordanetics. He has used these rules to cope with his personal madness, and having done so, has established himself as a messianic shepherd capable of gathering others struggling with clinical depression and delusions around him. Peterson, the self-anointed visionary, descends into the chaos of the oppressed like the crucified Christ harrowing hell. Holding the rules for the twelve-rule path of the middle way, he metaphorically offers himself as both a sacrifice and a savior to those willing to follow him out of chaos and help him restore the balance. And if they do as he has done, and seek as he has sought, he promises them a world that will bend, slowly and over time, to their will. Chapter 19 The Cult of Jordanetics Quote, Is it any wonder that there should be failing and error, not in the highest, the intellectual, principle, but in souls that are like undeveloped children? End quote. Plotinus, Against the Gnostics Jordan Peterson is mentally ill, and many of his followers suffer from depression, anxiety, and other forms of mental illness. That is why it is hard for mentally healthy individuals to understand the strength of his appeal. It can be very hard for normal, well-adjusted people to begin to understand how those who are mentally unstable, imbalanced, or otherwise unwell can fall for such obvious lunacy. Falling into a cult can observably be surprisingly easy. I don't pretend to understand anything about the underlying psychology of those who do, but the mechanism for capturing cultists is fairly straightforward. First, the cult has to provide the potential cultist with assistance. Then it gradually builds trust in both the leader and the cult itself. Then it convinces the potential cultist, now a novice, to commit to something false. It repeats this process in cycles, initiating the newcomer into falsehood after falsehood until the initiate is spending most of his life living a lie, 
to such a degree that admitting to any of the lies means rejecting most of what has become his life. The NX IVM cult started by Keith Rainier, now being investigated for its illegal money laundering and sex slavery, is replete with astonishing stories of women voluntarily submitting to branding and sexual servitude for the sake of the organization. Rainier was so successful in convincing his followers of his delusional reality that wealthy heiresses and Hollywood actresses not only raised tens of millions of dollars for it, but even corrupted the personal emissary for peace for the Dalai Lama. To expand its membership, the Annex IVM cult provided both free and paid courses for self-improvement to attract initiates. This is similar to Scientology. The free courses are offered in the early stages, and the paid courses gradually rise in cost over time as the believer gets deeper and deeper into it. Jordanetics presently appears to be in the early stages of this approach, as Peterson is already charging hundreds of dollars for VIP meet and greet upgrades to his tours, which include meet and greet event with Jordan Peterson, one photo with Jordan Peterson, and one exclusive VIP laminate. While Peterson may be content with his multiple revenue streams of book sales, online self-help services, personality assessments, lectures, and speaking tours, the past history of self-help crazes tends to indicate that he will not. He is, after all, on a mission to save the world. It is more likely that, like Dianetics transforming into Scientology, Jordanetics will eventually transform into a pseudo-religious New Age globalist cult. Isn't this a little paranoid? Not at all. Jordanetics already has two of the three elements required for destructive cult formation in place. According to psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton, cults can be identified by three characteristics. One, a charismatic leader who increasingly becomes an object of worship as the general principles that may have originally sustained the group lose their power. Two, a process I call coercive persuasion or thought reform. Three, the economic sexual, and other exploitation of group members by the leader and the ruling coterie. End quote. The Harvard Mental Health Letter, Volume 7, Number 8, February 1981, reprinted in AFF News, Volume 2, Number 5, 1996. There is a fourth element that inevitably tends to be in place when these cults are formed. What does the leader of the cult say of Jesus Christ? Does he say anything about Jesus at all? How does he describe Jesus? As it happens, Young, Crowley, Hubbard, and Peterson all describe Jesus Christ in very similar fashion, to such an extent that when comparing their perspectives, it is very hard to distinguish Peterson's from the other esotericists who regard Christ as a powerful mystic symbol. Quote, the central ideas of Christianity are rooted in Gnostic philosophy, which, in accordance with psychological laws, simply had to grow up at a time when the classical religions had become obsolete. It was founded on the perception of symbols thrown up by the unconscious individuation process, which always sets in when the collective dominance of human life fall into decay. At such a time, there is bound to be a considerable number of individuals who are possessed by archetypes of a numinous nature that force their way to the surface in order to form new dominance. This state of possession shows itself almost without exception in the fact that the possessed identify themselves with the archetypal contents of their unconscious, and because they do not realize that the role which is being thrust upon them is the effect of new contents still to be understood, they exemplify these concretely in their own lives, thus becoming prophets and reformers. Insofar as the archetypal content of the Christian drama was able to give satisfying expression to the uneasy and clamorous unconscious of the many, the consensus omnium raised this drama to a universally binding truth, not of course by an act of judgment, but by the irrational fact of possession, which is far more effective. Thus Jesus became the tutelary image or amulet against the archetypal powers that threatened to possess everyone. End quote. Maps of Meaning, The Architecture of Belief 
Peterson's visions of himself as a crucified messiah atop the pyramids of the all-seeing eye of Horus may only be harmless metaphors or an unconscious Freudian expression of his sexual desire for his relatives, but as anyone who has criticized Peterson knows very well, he is a weirdly charismatic man whose followers only support him more fervently when his mistakes are exposed. The Twelve Rule Path is a guide for reshaping one's thought processes, and its deceptive dualistic techniques are designed to manipulate the reader into something deeper than mere self-help. Furthermore, Peterson has already created a system of fee-based self-authoring services capable of serving as an isolating infrastructure of systematic exploitation in the style of Scientology and NXVIM courses. And as a psychologist, he knows very well that man, even godless post-Christian man, needs religion. Even if he does not call it religion, man needs something upon which to build his belief systems. Quote, if religion is erased, something must be put in its place. Belief systems are intrinsic to human intelligence and survival. They frame the flux of primary experience, which would otherwise flood the mind. End quote. Camille Peglia. Constructing the basis for a new world religion would certainly explain why Jordan Peterson's 12 rules are so deeply coded with double meaning. After all, a man establishing a religion that features himself as its prophet and savior will need to do so in secret for many reasons. First, he must keep his activities from being exposed to too much outside scrutiny. Second, he must filter the true believer from the merely curious. Third, he must separate the potential initiates from the doubters and the failures. Fourth, he must maintain plausible deniability for outsiders while drawing the acolyte in ever deeper. One might well describe Peterson's philosophy as a literal pyramid scheme, albeit one with an all-seeing eye watching over it. Think about the possibility that Peterson's religiosity is not mere flavor, but an indication that he is attempting to establish an actual post-Christian religion. In Twelve Rules for Life, Peterson sneaks in an important concept that will escape most, if not all, of his readers. He does this in Rule 2, when he is talking about the spark of the divine. Quote, We are low-resolution, canonic versions of God. We can make order from chaos and vice versa in our way with our words. So we may not exactly be God, but we're not exactly nothing either. End quote. Twelve Rules for Life a superficial reading tends to indicate that Peterson is downplaying the potential godhood of humanity. He seems to be saying that while human beings are made in the image of God, they aren't perfect, and they aren't God, but they can model an ethos after him. But that isn't what he's saying here. He can't be, because he is again playing the reader false with a misleading definition. The word canonic does not mean low resolution. Canonic is a theological term, and a very specific one at that. It refers directly to Jesus Christ and the emptying out of his will in perfect obedience to God's will. It is a direct and unambiguous reference to the willing self-sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Quote, in Christian theology, kenosis, in the Greek, literally, the act of emptying, is the self-emptying of Jesus' own will and becoming entirely receptive to God's divine will." End quote. Wikipedia. In Eastern Orthodoxy, mystics believe that Christ sets the core example of kenosis that his followers are to attempt in humility. Protestants likewise view kenosis as Christ's emptying of himself for the sake of the world. Roman Catholics possess a papal encyclical, Sempiternus Rex Christus, which condemns heretics who argue that Christ emptied himself, not of his will, but his divinity, during the crucifixion. The deceptive seed Peterson plants here with this revised definition of canonic is the exceedingly heretical and anti-Christian claim that our will is as close to God's will as the universe allows. We are not precisely the God that is described in the Bible. We are not that perfect platonic ideal but our words have divine power nevertheless. 
Peterson's frequent citations of the Bible and public agonizing over the historical existence of Jesus Christ provides him with the cover he requires to substitute an occult form of universal neo-Taoism for Christianity. As the body of Christ becomes his own body, the language and message of Jesus Christ is transformed into the language and message of Jordan Peterson. Considering how ignorant of Christian theology Peterson has proven to be and how inaccurately he represents it, there can be little doubt that he misrepresents Taoism in important ways too. But the important thing is that he treats Christianity as his own personal Trojan horse with all manner of occult heresies lurking within. There are a number of signs that will alert us if Jordanetics begins to transform into a full-blown religious cult. For example, if Peterson's followers start to establish international connections around the world and start founding institutions for the study and propagation of the Twelve Rule Path, that will be a reliable indicator that what one fan has told us feels like a movement has evolved into an advanced form of Jordanetics that represents a realization of the post-Christian vision originally proposed by Yeats. Quote, As I read it, there are three distinct stages to Yeats' narrative. The first is the age when Christian values were the unchallenged core of Western civilization. This was a vital, flourishing civilization, but now it is over. The second stage is nihilism, both active and passive, occasioned by the loss of these core values. This is the present day for Yeats and ourselves. The third stage, which is yet to come, will follow the birth of the rough beast. Just as the birth of Jesus inaugurated Christian civilization, the rough beast will inaugurate a new pagan civilization. Its core values will be different than Christian values, which of course horrifies Christians who hope to revive their religion. But the new pagan values, unlike Christian ones, will actually be believed, bringing the reign of nihilism to its end and creating a new, vital civilization. For pagans, this is a message of hope. End quote. Greg Johnson, Yeats's Pagan Second Coming. Jordanetics, taken at face value, is an observably evil philosophy. It would be considerably worse and considerably more dangerous were it to transform into a post-Christian religious cult. But it does not have to do so in order for Jordan Peterson's teachings, training, and psycho-spiritual pathway to prove destructive to individuals and what is left of Western civilization alike. Chapter 20. The Global Vision of Jordanetics Quote, I worked on the UN Secretary General's High Panel for Sustainability report that was delivered, I believe, in 2013, and rewrote the underlying narrative to strip out most of the ideological claptrap. End quote. Dr. Jordan Peterson It may surprise some of his fans to know that Jordan Peterson is a politician at heart. When he was only a teenager, he was already a member of the New Democratic Party, which was created in 1961 from a merger of the Canadian Labour Congress and the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, which was a populist agrarian party that had been part of the social gospel movement, but subsequently evolved into a modern socialist party. The NDP is a secular socialist party that advocates issues such as gay rights, international peace, and environmental stewardship. Not only that, but in 1971, Peterson even ran for the vice presidency of the Alberta NDP at the age of 14 and came within 13 votes of winning. His picture was featured in the local newspaper, and Peterson himself was quoted as saying, I won't be happy until I'm elected prime minister. Although Peterson claims to have disavowed his socialist ideology and now describes himself as having evolved beyond all ideologies, he remains an avowed globalist. His primary objective, the mission to which he believes himself to be called to save the world, is to bind the nationalists in order to permit the despoiling of their collective houses. He is committed to this because he wrongly believes that global governance will somehow prevent World War III from occurring. This is why he is listed as a Sherpa for one of the eminent persons of the United Nations in the UN report he co-authored. This is why he attended the 2018 meeting of the Trilateral Commission 
in Jablana, Slovenia. Jordan Peterson is a wicked and delusional man who has somehow managed to conceal from his misguided followers that he is actively attempting to neuter them in the service of globalist evil. The strange thing is that even when his active involvement in globalist politics is revealed, such as his authorship of Resilient People, Resilient Planet, A Future Worth Choosing, his committed fans refuse to even consider the idea that he is involved in politics at all, let alone a deeply political creature. For example, one of my Darkstream viewers commented that he stopped watching my videos for several months due to my repeated attacks on Peterson. He claimed that I did not realize, quote, that Peterson uses philosophy and psychology better than anyone to liberate both left and right brainwashed sheep, and as a result, stays above politics, end quote. The amazing thing is that Peterson's cargo cultists are capable of publicly asserting that Peterson is above politics while he is literally working for the United Nations and relentlessly pushing its globalist line. The truth is that Jordan Peterson is a committed, professional globalist. His most cherished objectives are directly opposed to the survival of America and the West, while some view his rhetoric criticizing globalist institutions such as the United Nations and the European Union as an indication that he is opposed to globalism, they fail to note that he is trying to fix them. Quote, The distance between the typical citizen and the bureaucracy that runs the entire structure has got so great that it's an element of destabilization in and of itself, and so people revert back to say, nationalistic identities, because it's something that they can relate to." End quote. That is not criticism of the existence of the globalist institutions or their objectives. It is merely criticism of their implementation. If someone was trying to fix Nazism, you wouldn't say that he's a Jewish ally. If someone was trying to fix communism, you wouldn't say that he is a capitalist ally. Jordan Peterson is trying to fix globalism. That necessarily means that he is trying to destroy nationalism, your nation, and your people, which are objectives that he doesn't even hide. He condemns group identity as pathological. This is an insane condemnation of friends, family, faith, and nation as mental illness. He elevates the individual to the sovereign level at the expense of literally everyone around him. The best way to win the cultural and ideological wars, he insists, is not to fight them, but to preemptively surrender. Quote, I would recommend that people don't do it because the problem with the radical leftists and their damn identity politics is that it's unbelievably pathological. And if you decide to fight that by playing the same game, you think, well, I'll play the same game and then I'll win. It's like, you know you won't, because by playing the game, you lose. That's the thing about your political opponents, is that you don't play their damn game, you play a different game. And so you know what I've been trying to encourage people to do is instead of playing the collectivist game, and that would include alt-right identity politics, is to play the individualist game and to get their act together. The best revenge, I would say, you shouldn't be doing it for revenge, but the best revenge against the collective left of the collectivist leftists is to live a stalwart, meaningful, and high-quality individual life, and that's also the pathway that requires the most responsibility and sacrifice, and I think is the most honorable and least self-deceptive." Jordan Peterson's Message to Alt-Right Ideologues For Peterson to say that it is the honorable and the least self-deceptive path for Americans to simply accept the mass invasion of over a hundred million people, to address the largest invasion in all of human history by being noble and individual and leading a meaningful life, is such obvious nonsense that it almost defies description. Imagine if the great men of history had not been pathological group identitarians, but had followed the philosophy of Jordan Peterson's 12-rule path. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask how you can live a stalwart, meaningful, and high-quality individual life. Jordan B. Kennedy No dumb bastard ever won a war by going out and dying for his country. He won it by living a stalwart, meaningful, and high-quality individual life. Jordan B. Patton 
If we play the Britons' game, we lose. Go home, everyone. Jordan B. Caesar. Dulce et decorum, et constantum, excellentum, significantem quae, proprium, whiteum, wewere. Jordan B. Horace. Moreover, I consider that Carthage must be ignored. Jordan B. Cicero. Imagine if Jordan Peterson had given that advice to the people of Poland. Imagine that he had given that advice to George Washington, or Cincinnatus, or Julius Caesar, or any other great man of history. Literally everyone of any note in history rejected the concept of going down to noble, individual defeat. Jesus Christ himself summoned twelve disciples to follow him. Even the Buddha, who rejected the world and saw it all as Maya, illusion, even he permitted his closest and dearest companions to help him with his life's work as he pursued his search for nirvana. What Peterson is saying is absolute and utter nonsense, and to sum up my response to his attack on nationalism and group identity, I will present a single quote from a man who understood identity politics much better than anyone. He was a political genius who masterfully managed an extraordinarily difficult situation with a small civic polity that was surrounded and dominated by much larger, more powerful neighbors, was comprised of competing ethnic and religious groups, and the way that he addressed the inevitable identity politics there was not pathological, it was based on reality, and it was absolutely true. Quote, In multiracial societies, you don't vote in accordance with your economic interests, you vote in accordance with race and religion. End quote. Lee Kuan Yew. You must never forget that Jordan Peterson's ultimate goal is to recreate the Tower of Babel. He is more than just a globalist. He is the spiritual descendant of the evil men who sought to challenge God himself. His insidious campaign against group identity, against nationalism, and against Western civilization is rooted in a literally satanic desire to raise up a single global government that will rule over all of humanity. And what Jordan Peterson is attempting to bring about through Jordanetics is the single global religion that will provide the spiritual bulwark for that massive totalitarian edifice, a religion in which he will serve the tripartite role of Messiah, Savior, and Pope. That may sound crazy and evil, and it is, but Jordan Peterson is crazy and evil. His motivations are very far from hidden. For more than two decades, he has been openly writing about his obsession with the Holocaust and his ambitions to save the world from the next one. Quote, I don't completely understand the driving force behind what I've been working on, although I understand it better now than I used to three or four years ago when it was literally driving me crazy. I had been obsessed with the idea of war for three or four years prior to that, often dreaming extremely violent dreams centered around the theme of destruction. I believe now that my concern with death on a mass scale was intimately tied into my personal life and that concerns with the meaning of life on a personal level, which arise with the contemplation of death, took a general form for me, which had to do with the value of humanity and the purpose of life in general. I hope to describe not only what the problem is in historical terms, but where a possible solution might lie, and what that solution conceivably could be, and I hope to describe it in a manner that makes its application possible." End quote. Maps of Meaning, The Architecture of Belief The driving force behind Jordan Peterson, the force that has driven him mad, is not the spirit of man. The driving force behind him and his dream of ending war by unifying humanity, by severing all human connections to one another, is a very different spirit, namely, the evil spirit that Jesus Christ called the God of this world. And this is the final and greatest paradox of Jordanetics. The driving force that inspires Jordan Peterson and has propelled him to such heights of fame and fortune is the driving force behind the very horrors of history whose recurrences he dreams of preventing through the establishment of his new religion. Epilogue of Wheat and Tares Quote, People are so tortured by the limitations and constraint of being 
that I am amazed they ever act properly or look beyond themselves at all. End quote. Dr. Jordan Peterson. I've seen many Peterson fans who do not consider themselves to be deceived by him talk about their ability to separate the wheat of his teachings from the chaff. Buried in the midst of the Petersonian word salad, they perceive individual gems of wisdom, or perhaps a well-turned phrase, or an intriguing metaphor, and find value in it. Anything else can be safely dismissed as nonsense. This would be a useful practice if Jordan Peterson's seeds of wisdom actually consisted of wheat. I hope that by now you have discovered that Jordan Peterson doesn't plant wheat. To stick with the metaphor, what he is planting is Lalium Tamulentum, commonly known as poison darnel, and described in the Bible as tear, a species of ryegrass that inhibits wheat production, but whose plant, in the early stages, is practically indistinguishable from wheat. It is common to some parts of the Middle East, and during Roman rule, it was illegal to sow tares in a wheat field, because discerning the good seed from the bad was practically impossible. This was a serious problem, because the tare seed contains a strong soporific, which was capable of rendering the individual who consumed it unconscious. This was the basis for one of Jesus Christ's more well-known parables. Quote, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. End quote. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Now, if Peterson is sowing a field with no wheat at all, a field that contains nothing besides these sleep-inducing seeds that appear to be healthy wheat during their early development, will there be any chaff to separate and burn in the end? What exactly is the true nature of the presumed wheat that you have valued and stored? If Peterson has planted both wheat and tares together, the only time to separate them comes late at harvest time, when the deceptive weeds and fruitful wheat are obvious. The harvest has arrived. Do you genuinely see anything but poison in Jordan Peterson's words now? Peterson advises you to become more self-absorbed, more obedient to authority, less ambitious, less loyal to your friends, less honest, more ruthless, weaker in your faith, and more like Jordan Peterson. Does that really strike you as a desirable path for your life? You may think that Peterson has helped others. You may think that he has helped you. But has he really done so? Even if you have managed to clean your room, stand up straight, or pet a cat without getting scratched, you may consider Jordan Peterson to be a gateway to Christianity. But while there are soldiers who have found Jesus Christ in a foxhole and people caught up in natural disasters or transportation crises who have cried out to God for mercy, that does not mean that war, hurricanes, or sinking ships should be considered evangelical tools. It is entirely possible that there are those who will listen to the insidious philosophy of Jordan Peterson and reject it in favor of a more spiritually healthy alternative. But while this is the best, of all the possible consequences that might result, it would not redeem the words and teachings of Peterson himself, nor would it justify his wickedness. The Gnostic nature of Jordanetics is its primary attraction, but therein also lies its inevitable downfall. For the truth will shine for all eternity, while falsehood can survive only as long as it remains safely hidden in the dark. Appendix A. No Conspiracy. No conspiracy, get it? No conspiracy. 
Jewish people are overrepresented in positions of competence and authority because, as a group, they have a higher mean IQ. There is no evidence whatsoever that Ashkenazi Jews are overrepresented in any occupations or interests for reasons other than intelligence and the associated effects of intelligence on personality and political belief. Thus, no conspiratorial claims based on ethnic identity need to be given credence. End quote. Dr. Jordan Peterson As I promised in the introduction, I have provided an updated version of my detailed analysis of Jordan Peterson's unprovoked attack on the excessively observant and the science of statistics alike in this appendix. His no conspiracy argument is constructed as follows. 1. One requires a victim and a perpetrator in order to play identity politics. 2. The far right has chosen European culture as a victim due to its unrecognized resentment and cowardly and incompetent failure to deal with the world forthrightly and have incorrectly selected the Jews as perpetrator due to Jewish overrepresentation in positions of authority, competence, and influence. 3. Jewish people are overrepresented in positions of competence and authority because, as a group, they have a higher mean IQ. 4. Jews have a mean IQ of 110 to 115. 5. 40.8% of the 145 plus IQ population is Jewish. 6. There is no evidence whatsoever that Ashkenazi Jews are overrepresented in any occupations slash interests for reasons other than intelligence and the associated effects of intelligence on personality and political belief. Thus, no conspiratorial claims based on ethnic identity need to be given credence. Peterson's argument is not merely incorrect. Literally every single aspect of it is false. It is so resolutely and demonstrably false that it is highly unlikely for Jordan Peterson to have constructed it in innocence by mistake, even given his self-confessed mathematical limitations. In my opinion, it clearly indicates a malicious intent to deceive his audience and to falsely accuse those he labels the far right. My responses to the six points of his argument are as follows. One. One does not require a victim or a perpetrator in order to play identity politics. One does not need to be aware of identity politics or even to believe they exist to find oneself engulfed in them. To quote Lee Kuan Yew, in multiracial societies, you don't vote in accordance with your economic interests and social interests. You vote in accordance with race and religion, end quote. All a society requires is sizable multiracial, multi-ethnic, or multi-religious components, and identity politics will inevitably appear once the minority populations become sufficiently numerous or influential. 2. European culture and the European nations of the West are observably and undeniably the victims of mass immigration, of a movement of peoples that is the largest in recorded human history. This is a fact that is no more disputable than the fact that the indigenous American populations were victims of mass immigration in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, or the fact that indigenous Asian populations were victims of immigration, colonization, and imperialism in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. The perpetrators are, by definition, the immigrants, as well as those who worked to alter the various laws to permit the entry of large numbers of immigrants. 3. Jews are not overrepresented in positions of competence and authority in the United States because, as a group, they have higher mean IQ. Because a. IQs over 145 do not tend to help, but rather tend to hinder an individual's ability to attain such positions and b. The higher mean IQ postulated is not high enough to compensate for their considerably smaller percentage of the population. 4. Jews do not have a mean IQ of 115. Globally, they appear to have a mean IQ that is an estimated maximum of 103.2. In the USA, where the percentage of the high IQ Ashkenazim subset makes up a higher percentage of the Jewish population, 
they have an estimated maximum mean IQ of 105.1. This is perfectly respectable. It simply is not in the 110 to 115 range. 5. Less than 4% of the 145 plus IQ population in the USA is Jewish, not more than 40%. 6. Whether they happen to be true or not, conspiratorial claims based on ethnic identity remain a valid potential explanation for Jewish overrepresentation and positions of competence and authority, no matter what Jordan Peterson claims to believe about the matter. He is, at best, an inept intellectual disputant, and at worst, an intentional deceiver. I will now proceed to substantiate my responses to points 3, 4, and 5 in detail. Response number 6 follows naturally from them. On point number three, I observe. Researchers at the University of Lausanne have determined that there is a linear relationship between intelligence and effective leadership, but this relationship only holds up to an IQ of 120. The association actually reverses at IQs above that level. This is primarily due to the IQ communication gap which prevents effective communication across two standard deviations of intelligence, or about 30 IQ points. This negative effect of high IQ is further compounded by the systematic statistical exclusion of the true cognitive elite from the intellectually elite professions. According to an article entitled The Inappropriately Excluded by Michael W. Ferguson, published in The Polymath, the probability of an individual establishing a career in an intellectually elite profession, such as physician, judge, professor, scientist, or CEO, increases in line with IQ to the Mensa level, which comprises the top 2% of the general population. The probability of a successful professional career peaks at 133, then falls about one-third by the time the individual's IQ reaches 140. After that, the probability of success declines rapidly, so that by the time an IQ of 150 is reached, the likelihood of the high IQ individual successfully pursuing an elite professional career has fallen by 97%. What this means, Ferguson explains, is that the majority of individuals with IQs over 140 have been systematically excluded from the very professions that are responsible for addressing the most important challenges of our time as well as ensuring the functionality of our social, scientific, political, and economic institutions. Contra Jordan Peterson's assumption, there actually appears to be a very strong inverse relationship between highly intelligent individuals possessing IQs over 140 and success in an academic or professional field. Therefore, Jordan Peterson's proposed explanation for disproportionate Jewish success in American society is not only incorrect, but ironically, would have demonstrated precisely the opposite of that which he was attempting to prove if it had been correct. The observation that Jews are overrepresented in positions of competence and authority in the United States actually serves as compelling evidence that their mean IQ cannot be uniquely and extraordinarily high. On point four, I observe, the primary and off-cited source of the 115 mean IQ claim is the 1957 study by Boris Levinson entitled The Intelligence of Applicants for Admission to Jewish Day Schools, published in Jewish Social Studies, Volume 19, Number 3 out of 4, July to October 1957, pages 129 to 140. In the study, which reported 114.88, mean IQ for the 2,083 very young students sampled, the author duly noted its intrinsic limitations. Quote, This study is limited to applicants for day schools adhering to the principles of the National Commission for Yeshiva Education. This sampling does not claim to represent the entire Jewish school population or even those children attending Yeshiva day schools with a different educational emphasis. End quote. That 114.88 mean IQ did not represent the entire U.S. Jewish population in 1956 and therefore cannot possibly represent the entire U.S. Jewish population 61 years later. Furthermore, even if it had correctly represented the entire Jewish Ashkenazi population in the USA then, 
It would not do so now, due to the fact that what had been a relatively pure Ashkenazi population two generations ago is now 44% genetically adulterated by the mainstream population due to intermarriage. The current U.S. population of 5,425,000 Jews is now made up of the following genetic groups. 51.6% Ashkenazi 40.6% half Ashkenazi, half European 7.8 Sephardic, Mizrahi, and other backgrounds. Remember, it's not the ethnic identity that magically conveys intelligence on an individual. Intelligence is primarily a consequence of the individual's genetic ancestry. Even if individuals in the second category consider themselves to be every bit as Jewish as their immigrant Jewish grandparents in a cultural, ethnic, or religious sense, it is not true from a genetic perspective, and the studies on mean Ashkenazi IQ therefore do not apply to them. I suspect that this is an unintentional focus on identity instead of genetics on Peterson's part, an ironic one given his attack on identity politics, and it is a mistake that he makes twice. Now, given that the 107.5 mean Ashkenazi IQ given by Lynn is at least possibly correct, unlike the false 115 claim, which cannot be, and the 102 mean IQ for white Americans, we can more reasonably estimate the half Ashkenazi mean IQ to be halfway between the two population groups, or 104.8. Since the non-Ashkenazi Jewish mean IQ is somewhere between 84.2 if A-IQ equals 115, and 91 if A-IQ equals 107.5, Given the reported average IQ of Israel being 95, this means that the maximum mean IQ of the U.S. Jewish population is 105.1, 3.1 points higher than the mean white IQ of 102, but nearly one point below the reported mean East Asian American IQ of 106. On point five, I observe... Peterson's assertion that 40.8% of the 145-plus IQ population in the USA is Jewish is not merely wrong, it is off by more than an order of magnitude. First, he ignores the relevant distinctions between the various minority populations. Second, he exaggerates the U.S. Jewish population by 10%. Third, he fails to account for the fact that 48.4% of that population is either part Ashkenazi or non-Ashkenazi and thereby exaggerates their mean IQ. And fourth, he again makes the mistake of relying upon identity rather than genetics for the white population. His use of the white non-Hispanic population alone is not correct here because the white Hispanic population is defined as being genetically white and therefore cannot be excluded from the white population numbers. With a mean IQ of 105.1 and a population of 5,425,000, the standard distribution curve indicates 21,158 Jews with 145 plus IQs in the United States. In addition to this, the mean IQ of 102 for the white population of 246,660,710 indicates 517,987 whites with 145 plus IQs plus 31,913 equally high IQ Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans plus another 39,523 Indian Americans as opposed to American Indians resident in the United States. So the correct ratio of the 145 plus IQ population is 21,158 of the 610,581 total. Jews therefore account for 3.5% of the 145 plus IQ set in the United States, not 40.8% of it. Jordan Peterson was off by more than an order of magnitude. Note that even if we were to generously allow Peterson his original assertion about the range of mean Jewish IQ, the statistics he presents to defend his conclusion are incorrect. At the highest end of his suggested range, 115, Jews would only account for 123,690 of the 713,113 high IQ population, or 17.3%. 
At the lower end of 110, the Jewish percentage would necessarily be reduced to less than one twelfth of the 145 plus IQ set in the United States. And just to demonstrate how ridiculous Peterson's statement was, in order to account for 40.8% of the U.S. 145 plus IQ population, the mean Jewish IQ would need to be 123.4, with 7.5% of all U.S. Jews possessing an IQ over 145. This should more than suffice to demonstrate that Jordan Peterson's argument is completely wrong, his conclusion is false, and his public charges of cowardice and incompetent failure to deal with the world forthrightly on the part of his critics are not only unfair and incorrect, they appear to be emotional projections of Peterson's own intellectual cowardice and his own failure to deal competently with statistics. On point six, I conclude. I do not know Jordan Peterson, but his incorrect and deceitful arguments and his unfair and unjustified attacks on his critics show him to be an inept and integrity-challenged coward who lacks a genuine commitment to the truth. The combination of his sudden success with his observable intellectual ineptitude suggests that he has been elevated by the mainstream media in order to provide a harmless, toothless, and non-Christian alternative to the failed conservative movement of William F. Buckley and the failed neoconservative movement of Bill Kristol and Ben Shapiro. The Source of the Myth Just as the journey of a thousand leagues begins with but a single step, even the most widespread and persistent myth can be inspired by a single source. So what was the original basis for Jordan Peterson's assertion that Jews are uniquely intelligent in the first place? Here are a number of the more often cited sources. Researchers who study the Ashkenazim agree that the children of Abraham are on top of the IQ chart. Steven Pinker, who lectured on Jews, genes, and intelligence in 2007, says their average IQ has been measured at 108 to 115. Richard Lynn, author of The Intelligence of American Jews in 2004, says it is only a half standard higher, 107.5. Henry Harpending, Jason Hardy, and Gregory Cochran, University of Utah authors of the 2005 research report Natural History of Ashkenazi Intelligence, state that their subjects score 0.75 to 1.0 standard deviations above the general European average corresponding to an IQ of 112 to 115. Charles Murray, in his 2007 essay, Jewish Genius, says, quote, their mean is somewhere in the range of 107 to 115, with 110 being a plausible compromise, end quote. A Jewish average IQ of 115 is eight points higher than the generally accepted IQ of their closest rivals, Northeast Asians, and approximately 40% higher than the global average IQ of 79.1 calculated by Richard Lynn and Tatu Van Hanen in IQ and Global Inequity. First, you will note the usual definitional switch we've learned to anticipate from Peterson. A subset, the pure Ashkenazi population, is frequently substituted for the full set of Jews with diverse genetic heritages. Second, if one takes the trouble to look up and read the studies that are often referenced but never cited, one is immediately struck by the fact that these studies are a. misrepresented, b. old and outdated, c. almost invariably authored by those with an identity-related bias, and d. contain samples that are a very small and limited subset of the subset of the set. For example, as previously noted, the primary source of the 115 IQ claim appears to be a 1957 study by Boris Levinson entitled The Intelligence of Applicants for Admission to Jewish Day Schools. But right in the study, which reported 114.88 mean IQ for the 2083 students sampled, the author specifically denied it was representational of the Jewish school population in the United States, much less the entire Jewish nation around the world. Levinson further admits that the students sampled only represented 38% of the 5,494 students attending the 16 day schools, raising the distinct possibility that the sampled scores were cherry-picked. 
Now, do you seriously believe that the mean of a partial subset of a wealthy private school subset of a geographically limited subset of a genetic subset is likely to be even remotely representational of the mean of the entire global population set, let alone to almost precisely nail the upper end. This is so utterly absurd on its face that for the more logically inclined, the mere existence of this study should suffice to conclusively refute the myth. Furthermore, in the study, Levinson refers to a 1956 study by Robert D. North concerning white American fourth graders from 16 independent private schools, and noted the following, quote, Many of these schools select their pupils on the base of mental ability and on the basis of mental ability and achievement. Because these schools charge tuition fees, most of their pupils come from higher socioeconomic levels. These children had a mean IQ of 119.3, end quote. Shall we therefore conclude that the average white American is more intelligent than the average Jew because one very small group of elite private-schooled white Americans outperformed another very small group of elite private-schooled Jews in the 1950s? Of course not. That would be absolutely nonsensical. So why do we accept the reverse conclusion? After all, the samples cited in the studies were not even remotely representative of either population subset then, let alone more than 60 years later. There are other statistical idiosyncrasies that demonstrate the complete irrelevance of these post-World War II IQ studies to current population IQ averages. One study reported that the average IQ of the boys sampled was 112.8 and that of the girls was 113.6. If we are to take these particular IQ studies as definitive, then we must conclude that girls are more intelligent than boys, all other subsequent studies and observations to the contrary. There are many other reasons to be dubious of what increasingly appears to be a statistical myth of uniquely high Jewish intelligence. Consider Israel, for example. It is a successful quasi-European society, superior in nearly all respects to the lower IQ Arab societies surrounding it, but it is no more technologically advanced or socioeconomically successful than most Western or East Asian societies, and it remains economically dependent upon regular handouts from Germany and the United States of America. Even after 70 years, despite many impressive accomplishments and advancements, it is not exactly the advanced Wakanda in the Middle East that one would expect a society constructed by such a uniquely intelligent population to be. An application of Occam's razor suggests that this is because it is not. Moreover, where was this disproportional high IQ success in Roman times, in the Middle Ages, and in the Renaissance? Where was it in the Napoleonic era? Why has what Peterson describes as overrepresentation in positions of competence and authority only appeared after a sufficient degree of broad societal influence in specific societies such as the United States and Israel has been obtained? And how did so many European nations manage to observably benefit after they supposedly reduced the average IQ of their populations as a result of the various historical expulsions? The good news for those who are interested in the truth, whatever it happens to be, is that despite the reproducibility crisis in science history, the relentless advancement of scientage means it is increasingly difficult to utilize dishonest citations of biased studies of limited relevance from six decades ago to deceive the general public. The advancement of genetic science and the confirmed links between genetics and intelligence can be safely expected to scientifically explode an outdated and self-serving myth that has been relentlessly pushed upon the unsuspecting American public, along with related myths such as the Zeroth Amendment, a nation of immigrants, the melting pot, and Judeo-Christianity. Regardless of what the actual facts of the matter turn out to be, they will eventually be known and they will eventually be scientifically confirmed beyond the possibility of reasonable dispute. If the skeptics are correct, and this assertion of uniquely high IQ turns out to be a myth, then we can safely expect to see the link that Jordan Peterson and others have made between high average IQ and societal success to be downplayed. 
Just as Ivy League admissions officers are already attempting to downplay the importance of test scores and intellectual merit in the admissions processes of the elite universities. In conclusion, it is perhaps worth noting that at least one IQ expert has said that my criticism of the position Peterson publicly espouses is not unfounded. John First of the Ulster Institute was following the discussion of the matter on my blog and left the following comment there. Quote, I more or less agree with Vox. I collaborate with Richard Lynn and I am familiar with the literature and most of the studies, both reported and not. As for Israel, on international tests, Hebrew speakers, Jews, score around the level of white Europeans, while Arab speakers score around that of other Middle Easterners, around one plus standard deviation below the European white mean. See, for example, why Israel does poorly in the PISA exams, Perceptions versus Reality, 2017, and the Taub Center's State of the Nation picture, 2014 to 2017 reports. For example, the non-Haredi Jewish PISA 2012 math average was 489, SD 93. For white Americans for the same year, it was 506, SD 83. For Israel and the U.S. as a whole, the means and SDs were respectively 481, SD 90, and 466, SD 105. There is year-to-year -year variability, but it is safe to say that on international math, reading, and science exams, Israeli Jews do no better than whites in typical Western countries. Note, these figures exclude most Haredi Jews, who both do rather poor on exams, see the Taub Center's reports, and who are around 80% Ashk. Thus the test-taking samples tend to be less Ashk than the general population, but the excluded Ashk are substantially less proficient than average. Thus, as Vox notes, if one argues that Ashk Israeli come in at around 115, one has to maintain that non-Ashk Jews come in around 85. Yet this latter conjecture is inconsistent with the variance among Jews, and more notably, the national scores at the 98th percentile, a point which can be shown quantitatively. End quote. Appendix B. Twelve questions for Jordan Peterson. Quote, the truth is something that burns. It burns off deadwood, and people don't like having their deadwood burnt off because they're 95% deadwood. End quote. Dr. Jordan Peterson. I am frequently asked by people planning to attend a Jordan Peterson lecture for suggestions concerning a question they can ask him if they are given the opportunity to do so in a Q&A session. So, here are 12 questions to which the answers he provides may serve to burn off a little of the old deadwood. 1. Since you have said that Jewish possession of a mean IQ 10 to 15 points above the average is responsible for their societal success in the United States, is it correct to conclude that it is the African-American mean IQ being 15 points below the average that is responsible for their societal failure there? 2. What is the longest you have ever gone without sleep? 3. Do you still feel that you will never be happy until you are elected Prime Minister? Have you ever known happiness or joy? 4. Have you ever taken part in an occult or esoteric ritual? 5. Given that you are an outspoken fan of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, would you be willing to write an introduction to the English translation of his book, 200 Years Together? 6. Did you ever experience physical or sexual abuse as a minor? 7. You have said that you consider group identity to be dangerous and pathological. Do you consider yourself to be a Canadian? 8. As a professional psychologist, how would you describe your mental illness in clinical terms? 9. Have you ever been baptized as an adult in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? 10. Do you believe that you are destined to save humanity from destroying itself? If so, how would you identify the force or being that has chosen you to do so? 11.
11. Have you ever been professionally diagnosed as a sociopath or a schizophrenic? 12. What will you call yourself as the head of this post-Christian religion of the twelve-rule path of balance for which you are presently proselytizing? The parapope of psycho-spiritualism? The tetrarch of therapeutic neothelema? The arch-prophet of the post-Adamic apotheosis? Appendix C. Twelve Real Rules for Life. Quote, All is vanity. What is it that we must bestow our care and diligence upon? Even upon this only, that our minds and wills be just, that our actions be charitable, that our speech be never deceitful, and that our understanding be not subject to error, that our inclination be always set to embrace whatsoever shall happen unto us. End quote. Marcus Aurelius in light of my criticism and open contempt for Jordan Peterson's 12 rules on both the superficial and secret levels, I am occasionally asked to provide 12 alternative rules that would prove more effective for the individual seeking to improve his life. After a modicum of reflection, these are my suggestions, drawn from 50 years of various successes and failures. 1. Embrace the Iron Lifting weights will not only help you stand up straight, it will make you stronger, healthier, and more confident. The iron teaches the weak to be strong, and it teaches the strong to be humble. 2. Take the wheel. You are the ultimate architect of your own decisions and actions. Even if you were dealt a bad card by life, even if your genetics are inferior, your upbringing was terrible, and your instincts are suboptimal, you are the only one who can improve yourself. You are driving, and only you can determine the destination. 3. Be the friend that you want to have. Smiles are contagious. Loyalty inspires loyalty. Stand by those who stand by you. Give every friend who fails you a second chance. Only abandon those who have repeatedly proven that they cannot be trusted and do not wish you well. 4. Envision perfection and pursue excellence. You will never achieve perfection, but if you envision it and you strive for it, you may well achieve success and perhaps even excellence. 5. Put a ring on it. Marriage is the manifestation of love. Children are the manifestation of hope. Raising a family to serve as the foundation of future generations is how man rebels against an uncaring universe, a fallen world, and the spirits of despair and destruction. Yes, there are real risks, especially in the current social and legal environment, but they are well worth taking, nevertheless. 6. Set your face against evil. You will encounter evil within and evil without on a daily basis. Stand against all of it, without fear, without hesitation, and without remorse. And when you fail, when you give in to temptation, when you are defeated, regroup, repent, and rise again. 7. Do what is right. Learn to listen to the still, small voice of conscience. Do what you know to be right, not what you can rationalize, justify, or excuse. If you have to talk yourself into something, then you probably already know in your heart of hearts that you are doing the wrong thing. 8. Tell the truth in kindness. It is too hard and too exhausting to spend all your mental energies trying to keep track of an ever-growing multitude of exaggerations, false narratives, self-serving spins, and outright lies. Just tell the truth as you best understand it without taking pride in it or using it to hurt others. 9. Learn the easy way. You will always encounter those who are stronger, smarter, and more successful than you are. Rather than envying them or attempting to tear them down to make yourself feel better, do your best to learn from them and apply those lessons to your own life. It is considerably easier and more efficient to learn from the mistakes of others than it is to make all of those same mistakes yourself. 10. Believe the mirror. The most reliably self-destructive mistake you can make is to lie to yourself about who, what, 
and where you are, because doing so precludes any real self-improvement. Be ruthless with your self-assessments without wallowing in self-pity or despair. 11. Get back on the horse. Perseverance is one of the most important skills a man can develop. There is absolutely no substitute for the confidence and the courage that comes from the certain knowledge that you will get up again after an opponent or life knocks you down. 12. Find a best friend. Dogs teach us many things, perhaps the most important of which is what unconditional love is. No matter how rich and successful a man may be, there is no life that the addition of a dog would not considerably improve. And yes, all dogs go to heaven, obviously, because heaven would not be paradise without them.